Great Room, 16 Great Neck Road North, Mashpee, Mass. The time is 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. I welcome everyone here tonight. We are being broadcast live on Channel 18 and streamed live on the Town of Mashpee website at www.mashpeema.gov backslash channel.18. We are being videoed and recorded tonight. I'd video recorded tonight. I'd like to start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Mary, we start us off. Yes, thank you. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, under, under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we start, welcome, Willow Bend. Before we begin our public meeting, I want to thank all of you on the board here for selecting me as your chair. I am going to work very enthusiastically with the help of all of you to bring about collaboration and harmony and results to our board. We have a good board. Rob, yes. as an, our associate member, is a constant Calm voice of reason and decency. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Dale, our newly elected board member, he gives us a youthful perspective and solid knowledge of environmental issues as assistant director of natural resources for the tribe. Dennis <laughs> brings his extensive construction knowledge along with vast institutional wisdom having been on this board for 30 years. Uh, right. Dennis, always has, <laughs> Dennis always has good comments. And even if you don't agree with him, for some reason, you can never get mad at him. <laughs> Mary. I skipped you, but I'll come back to you. Mary has an encyclopedic knowledge of all things planning board. The rules, the regulations, the procedure, and expertise in housing, as well as other substantive issues. Thank you. Mike, uh -oh. <laughs> he comes to this planning board from a number of town committees, two terms on the select board, two terms on the finance committee, executive director of the Peninsula Council, the new Seabury governing board. And I think, are you on the architectural review board? I am. You like things pretty and attractive. And you love trees, right? I love things pretty and attractive. Partial to trees, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Evan is not a board member, of course. He's our town planner. But he provides us with solid technical assistance on all planning issues. We couldn't do without him. I, um, I come with the legal skills I know. And I'm always looking for evidence, weighing all sides of an issue as I try to figure out which way to vote. Now. When Mike was running for the planning board, he said, and I quote, we have, to, we have to balance development and environmental issues, concerns. He's right. And we have to do it not as combatants with each other, but as colleagues working for a common goal. We have to try to make this town more prosperous. This is our goal, more prosperous, more environmentally healthy, and our citizens happier. Because the happiest level is not that high right now. We know what we have to do. Figuratively speaking, we must put down our swords and pick up the plow and plant the seeds for a better Mashpee. As you prepare to vote on some issue, ask yourself, will my decision contribute to the town's prosperity environmental health, and happiness quotient of our people? If your answer is yes, go for it. Sometimes it's going to take political courage. So let's move the needle. Thank you. OK, uh, got to watch the time here. Uh, the um, approval or disapproval of the minutes. Any, any questions, any edits? So moved. Okay. Any, uh, no discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Okay. 
Motion passes. All right, it's uh, not quite time for our public hearing. So um, let's see if we can take something else here. We can sign the covenant release, Madam okay. Chair. Okay, good. That's um, the covenant release document for Silver Leaf Lane. The release was on 5-3-2023. I'm going to give it to you first, Karen, and uh, pass it around the table. Okay. Your signature, Jason, for reach chairman. Okay. Okay. All right, very good. We have to do that at a board meeting, but this won't go on record until we're done. I don't have the bond yet. Oh, you're a notary, right? Yes. I signed it for the stated purpose <clears throat> voluntarily. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, while we're waiting, after we have our public hearing on the Southworth, um, we can have public comment, but it will be only on the matter before us. <coughs> we'll have time for other comments at the toward the end of the meeting. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Well, I could sing an aria for you. Should we wait or should we go forward? Um, let me see. Is there something short you could do, Ev? You want to jump to uh, board and community reports? Yeah. The co okay, the community reports, sure. Um, Wrap those up and then we can. Cape Cod Commission. Um, so the Cape Cod Commission is continuing to work on its regional housing strategy. Um, I went to uh, a, a stakeholder meeting um, in Mashpee. I think there's another one, and uh, I think it's June 23rd. It's, it's in the, it's in that week at least. It's the 20, 21st, 22nd, or 23rd. Um, and there is a housing survey right now on the Cape Cod Commission website. So if people Google Cape Cod Commission Regional Housing Strategy, you'll get to their web page that has more information and the link to the housing survey. So that's, what's, that's what I know about what's going on at the Cape Cod Commission right now. Okay, I'll skip the CPC because that might be a little longer. Design review, that's my committee, no meeting. Okay, we'll just wait a minute here. I can do environmental oversight committee real quick. Okay. Um, Dale is this uh, board's representative to the Environmental Oversight Committee. The Environmental Oversight Committee hasn't met in a while, so I emailed the town <clears> manager <throat> asking for help to get that going, and I met him regarding a different issue, but as, at the end of the meeting, I asked him if he would help us get that going again. So st stay tuned. I'm, tr I'm working with the town manager Thank to you, get, get a date. That. Thank you. Okay. Seeing that the appointed hour time has, has arrived, I open the public <coughs> hearing and I read the Mashpee Planning Board public hearing notice. Pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 11, the Mashpee Planning Board will hold the public hearing on Wednesday, May 1, 2023. That's the old date, the original date, at 7.10 p.m. at the Mashpee Town Hall 16 Great Neck Road North to consider an application from Southworth Mashpee Properties LLC property owner to modify the Willow Bend Country Club special permit. The applicant 
proposes to construct a 14 unit single family cottage community immediately contiguous to the Willow Bend Golf Course at 275 Quinnaquisset Avenue, map 69, block 32. The existing single family dwelling is proposed for demolition. With these changes, the total unit count for the Willow Bend project would be increased to 287 if the board authorizes the annexation of 275 Quinnaquisset into Willow Bend special permit as allowed. 287 dwelling units is the maximum number of dwelling units authorized under the special permit. All units will be connected to and served by the existing privately owned wastewater treatment plant, which serves the entire Willow Bend project. Submitted by Mary E. Wagon, Mashpee Planning Board. Good evening. Okay. Um, for the record, Jack McElhenney, attorney for South Wharf Mashpee Properties. Uh, with me is Troy Miller, the director of development for South Worth, and our site engineer, Matt Eddy. Uh, Dennis Ring, our construction uh, manager, is also here. So this is a uh, continued hearing uh, for the application originally filed uh, back in, in January for uh, 14 units on uh, the five acres at 275 Quinnaquisset Ave. Uh, since that time, through the process, we've made a number of changes uh, in the project, including reducing the unit count from 14 to 12, and we want to speak to that in more detail tonight. Uh, but before uh, getting into what we will deal with tonight, I should reemphasize the chair's uh, uh, point that uh, we understand we are not talking about a, a related issue, which is uh, the condition from the 1991 special permit limiting uh, bedroom count within Willow Bend. Uh, that has been separately noticed as a, as a separate modification. It will be heard uh, two weeks from tonight. The public notice has, has gone, out, gone out for that. So we understand that that is not part of this public hearing process. Um, it just just quickly before turning it over to Matt, uh, we have, since our last meeting, had a very uh, good meeting with the Conservation Commission. Uh, as a result of that, we've made even further changes uh, to the plan, primarily focused on, on wetland impacts. Uh, we also had the opportunity uh, yesterday to meet with Evan and one of the neighbors on Simons Narrows Roads to hear about some of the community concerns and thoughts about how the project uh, could go forward or be or be improved. Uh, so with that, I'll let Matt give a quick summary of, of the key changes. Hi, good evening. Uh, for the record, Matthew Eddy, professional engineer with Baxter and I Engineering and Surveying. Um, just to follow up to Jack's uh, introduction there, so uh, from the uh, prior uh, hearing before this board on April 19th. This is the uh, first continued hearing with uh, formal presentation based on the changes um, that we've made. Um, we've submitted three revised sheets, which you should have in your packages, which include the overall master layout, uh, the revised turning template plan for the uh, fire department uh, uh, tower truck, and then the overall master mitigation plan. Um, these plans that you have before you have addressed, uh, I believe, most, if not all, of the comments that you've made, that the board made, based on the site layout perspectives. <coughs> uh, plan revision date is uh, 523, as you should have before you. So with that, I'm just going to uh, go through the uh, revisions that we've made, which were in uh, direct relation to the comments that this board made previously. So as Jack pointed out, uh, we have reduced the overall unit count um, from 14 units to 12 units. That allowed us to space the units, uh, um, providing 20 feet or better between uh, the main structures, which was one of the comments. Um, it has enhanced the buffer along uh, Quinnaquisset Ave, so we now have a uh, 65 feet or a little bit better of vegetated buffer off of Quinnaquisset to the structures. Um, additionally, uh, another very significant change was based on our last conservation uh, commission hearing. Um, 
we actually relocated the village green, if you recall, was in this area of this uh, bordering vegetated wetland. Uh, so that has now been pulled out and we've moved it over to the east. And this is now contiguous with the golf course. Uh, this here, that square box that you see there is the tee box for what's known as bog one um, on the, uh, bog, the uh, nine holes that they refer to as the bog. <clears throat> so this is now contiguous to that and pulled out of that BVW area. So again, a significant change to the layout there. <clears throat> um, so in doing so, the buffer area along uh, this wetland and village green area has been obviously significantly enhanced. We are still, and open for discussion obviously, but we are still proposing a small stormwater management four bay. You see that, that's that gray shaded area. Um, that is done to accommodate and pick up uh, existing stormwater runoff coming off of Quinnequisset Ave um, and into the uh, four bay to allow us to uh, provide pretreatment and water quality before entering the wetland system. And as you can see, I mean, part of this, this, this we put it directly adjacent to the um, Quinnequisset Road right of way. And if you look, you see that green line there. That's, that's the wetland delineation, which actually goes slightly into the road shoulder. So this is done, this, this area here is being provided um, for that water quality enhancement on Quinnequisset, which we believe is a, you know, a significant environmental benefit to the, for the town and, and for the public. So again, uh, be interested to hear, you know, thoughts and feedback on that from the board. Um, we have also, based on comments that the board made and concerns raised, um, we have increased the road width uh, to 20 feet from 16 feet. Um, the T turnaround for the uh, fire truck, again, every, that all works, you know, similar fashion as to the initial layout, but we've actually, with the reduction of the units and the um, shifting of the units, we've been able to remove any of the private driveways off of that T turnaround. So now that, uh, that uh, eliminates any potential conflict of, of cars um, that are being parked by the homeowners there. We've also additionally added um, signs around this T turnaround for you know, the state fire lane, no parking, just again to help try to deter uh, any conflicts with parked vehicles. Um, we've added, I know there was a comment on the overall uh, lawn area provided. I believe the prior special permit noted 35%. We're well under that. Uh, it's noted on the plans. I want to say it's around 20% or so. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's actually at, right at 20%. So again, well under the 35% um, identified in the, in the prior special permits. Um, I <clears throat> resubmitted the, the uh, fire uh, turning template plan. Again, just showing that circulation with the wider road, et cetera. I know there was some discussion about the turning template and the you know, potential conflict with the island at the entrance of the road. Uh, so that um, has been um, fully cleared and uh, provides more clearance from the island, et, et, et cetera. So, um, Matt, can you say that again? Did you change the entrance way? I did not need to change the entrance geometry. Mm -hmm. Radii are still the same, the island's still the same, but the road was 16 feet, went to 20 feet provided more maneuvering ability. So as the fire truck comes in, I know Ed was concerned that it was getting too close to the island, so it's provided more separation from the island. Um, and then the plan that you see up here on the screen, that's actually the master mitigation plan. Um, so with the reduction of overall wetland impact, we went from, uh, what we're at, almost 46,000 square feet of proposed wetland impact. Um, it's actually been reduced down to uh, about a little over 7,600 square feet, so a significant reduction. And of that 7,600 square feet, 1,370, so almost 1,400 feet, is from that four bay area that we're proposing because we believe it's a, it's a, it's a good design, it's a good way to do it, it's to, to provide water quality treatment. So again, if the board says they don't want us to do anything here, that comes out and the, and the impact would drop another 1,300 square feet. But again, I think we believe that's a, a good design and I had discussed that with Ed uh, Pesci as well. I'm sure he can 
you know, give his thoughts to the board uh, when he's here. <clears throat> um, so with that uh, reduction of wetland impact, uh, the mitigation now that's uh, being provided is, is bog one and two. If you recall, initially it was going to be bog one, bog two, and then bog three over here. Uh, so now it's just bog one and bog two. Again, still substantially more than what's required. Um, just by way of um, generalities, I'll say the bog one and two, that's over two acres of uh, wetland restoration, removing active cranberry bogs and restoring those to uh, uh, natural wetland system. Um, so it's over 88,000 square feet of restored wetland for 7,600 square feet of wetland impact. So if you look at just the wetland impact pieces, it's over 10 times the amount of wetland impact that's actually happening that is then being restored by removal of these active bogs. There are then other benefits that, you know, from the conservation standpoint, with the you know buffer impacts and so forth, that's part of the additional mitigation. Again, we're still providing well over 50% of what's required by conservation. It's enhancing uh, with the restoration of bog one and two. That's Quaker Run is down the middle of yeah. this. That's all considered riverfront area and was called the inner riparian zone, the, the first 100 feet of that, which is all, again, active cranberry bog right now. Um, with the restoration of this, that will restore um, the entire inner riparian area to a native, to a uh, natural state. Um, and with that, I mean, that's the summary of the changes overall based on the comments that the board had previously. And um, obviously I think, and you know, Jack or Troy can expound, but um, as we had talked previously, and I've also talked about this at the Conservation Commission hearing, once we hopefully get to a point where there's a layout that the board is happy with and says, yep, you've addressed our concerns and comments, we will then address and revise the grading and the stormwater management details. But we're gonna, we would like to wait to do that until the board gives us feedback and we say, okay, we're, we're at a spot where we're not going to be continuing to change the layout because that's the significant effort and cost that goes into the, the drainage and the grading efforts and so we just want to get to a point uh, that you know we feel that you know the board is, is happy with that we would then obviously be coming back with full detailed information which would then be reviewed by the board and, and by uh, by Ed Pesci so madam chair was that drainage and stormwater details yeah so the, okay. yeah it would be all the, it would be the grading, grading. All, you know, all the drainage and stormwater design which obviously as I'm sure everybody understands <laughs> as you shift aspects of the layout, obviously that affects all of those elements. And when we're doing you know, fairly significant moves on this layout, I will, as I'll call them, um, you really get into a, you know, a fair amount of effort on, it's gonna still follow that same scope and approach that, you've, that was submitted in the initial package, it's just having to adjust all of the, the information in detail. Yes. yes. On the, the drainage. Dennis, uh, microphone. <laughs> the drainage. That's when we walked out. We saw we saw that area where the mud was, where the water was going down. Yeah, right along the shoulder of Quinnequisset. Yes. Yeah, I noticed all a couple of times it was raining further down. There was like puddling past the yes. entrance way. Yeah, I think. I don't know if that's your property, but it'd be pretty cool if you could put <clears> another <throat> one there because that goes. You, well, I think that would be part of the you know, the improvements that are made. I think, you know, one thing when we went through plan review uh, with the town, um, Catherine Laurent, the director of DPW, had asked us to provide the Cape Cod berm, which is just the, yeah, yes. the asphalt right. yes. edge, if you will, along Quinnequisset. So we have will have been agreed to do that, and it's been shown on the overall plan. So from the entrance, there'll be a Cape Cod berm edge added along here, which will help, you know, control, direct, um, that drainage aspect and then getting into if we're you know if we do this four bay here would be able to address that whole shoulder area well, I think that makes sense. Okay. so yeah. the four bay along with the Cape Cod berm working together somehow yeah. it has an has a uh, the effect of stopping that flooding there yeah correct we'd be able to address all of that okay. that's occurring there another question Re restoration to the uh, to the cranberry box what do you mean by that you you take the cranberry box out yeah, there's a that. process. Um, I don't have the, I, we have a uh, 
consultant that's working for us, you may be familiar with Fuss and O'Neill. They're actually doing consulting yeah. with the town. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with Fuss and O'Neill for you know a few decades, I'll say. Um, and they are, uh, we've brought them on as the expert for the restoration of the, of the bogs. And so the bogs right now, they're currently active farmed cranberry bogs. So as a result of that, I mean, those are, they're mowed every year. They're, all the channels are made straight and controlled. You have fertilizers, you have pesticides, et cetera. That, that's my on. next question. Do they take the turd out because there's so much fertilizer? So you, it, it, it's a combination of that. So all, you know, all those practices will stop. You then actually get into, and you kind of do like what I'll call micro topography, yeah. where you create highs and lows in the wetland system to restore that wetland system, and then Quaker Run, which is currently pretty much of a straight channel because of the bog activity, that will be recreated to create a more meandering um, stream right. system. So again, it, it restores it back to a natural wetland system and it will then continue, that system will continue to restore and develop it and okay. redevelop itself. What I'd like to do is let the proponents finish their pre presentation and then we'll have, um, uh, is Ed going to be on, tel on the phone? Ed, Ed's still recovering from his eye shot. So no, I, I know. Is there somebody, pre is he presenting anything? Not today. No. And town planner, and then we'll get comments from the board in full and anybody who has written comments or wants to come up and speak on this subject. Okay, I mean, I believe that's that was the end of the presentation that I was going to be making. I, I don't know if there's anything else. Do um, you have anything to, to add, Troy? Troy? Uh, no, I, the only comment I'd make, I think, the, and you're gonna, I think, have a comment from the Conservation uh, Commission. We did meet with them on, on May 4th, had a very uh, detailed discussion right. about the mitigation and about the bog restoration and what would be involved there. And the commission felt it, and we agreed that this was a, a complex environmental project, so they wanted to engage uh, an independent peer review to go through the wetlands issues and engineering related issues for them. And you'll see in their comments tonight that they've done that. So they are gonna be looking at some of the wetland specific engineering issues uh, as part of their sort of parallel process to this board. Right, if, okay. Could, could I right. add one more yeah. comment to that? Um, as a result of that hearing, uh, I think it's fair to say, because it's part of the record of that hearing, that the conservation agent, Mashpee's conservation agent, Drew McManus, stated that he did believe that this was an overall environmental net benefit uh, for the area for this project. Um, so, and again, that's part of the minutes and, and the record, and we'll continue that dialogue with them, obviously. So, thank you. Okay. And Madam Chair, one other, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the other change to this plan that we, um, after hearing your, your comments, uh, the cart path access was taken out of what was, what is now a buffer off of Quinnaquisset, and that activity is now circulating through the south back into uh, into the golf community and back over is, to where is the that cart it path. right there? Yes, when we yeah, makes great. that turn and goes great. across okay. that existing bridge. And so, again, that takes some of that cart traffic away from Quinnaquisset and back into the community and allows for that circulation, the walkability, and the lack of vehicular traffic, but still able to circulate throughout the community. Okay. Any comments from our town planner? None. None? Ed's not here. I'll, we'll go around. For the board, Mary. So, um, <clears throat> hi. My first comment is to the chair, just to remind her that uh, Rob is seated on this matter. That's right. We have to have a super majority on this. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm not. I'm not sure that Dale can sit on the matter. I. I think that there were two meetings. Okay. And you can only miss one. Doesn't mean that Dale can't comment. Okay. Um, but I don't believe that he can vote. Thank so, you, madam. That's just okay. So, anyways, um, thank you very much. Um, there, there are a lot of changes in there uh, in response to comments from the public and the planning board, so I appreciate that. Um, I am concerned um, that there are previous conditions in the special permit that are not reflected here on the map, on the plan. In particular, I am still looking for that 100 foot buffer uh, from Quinnaquisset Avenue. Um, if you look at the surrounding pieces of your project, um, <clears throat> they all have a 100-foot buffer. 
I know that uh, you brought up um, the cluster subdivision at Willow Bend Circle um, that is off um, away from this area. Um, but I, I do see that as something very different than this because um, the way it's laid out, it's a subdivision. The buildings are further back than what you're proposing here. These are, these are very close with higher density, but that neighborhood, Willow Bend Circle, is, is a different planned creature completely. So while I was comfortable uh, with a buffer relief in that area, I'm not here. So just to give you that. I know that the special permit is not in compliance. We spoke about that. We did speak about it uh, under this public hearing, and it has to do with the bedroom count. Uh, um, I'm not going to allow any comment about the bedrooms. But tonight. I don't think that we can go forward and make any decision on this special permit. We have to keep uh, this public hearing open until uh, the special permit is in compliance. Um, the other thing is I'm going to have a, a, a great uh, amount of trouble finding on environmental factors. Um, as most of you know, to issue a special permit, the special permit granting authority has a list of things that it has to find. It has to find that this project does not contribute nuisance noise, for example. Um, so there, are, there is a slew of environmental um, issues that are, come under consideration. It has, it has to do with habitat and water quality. And um, that we will have to hear from the Conservation Commission, in my opinion, before um, we can find um, on this matter. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Oh, OK. Mike? Oh, uh, you know what? I'm very sorry. I got I got an email from I'm sorry I, we, I got an email from Drew Mc, uh, McManus, our conservation agent, which I put. Um, I have it here. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I don't know if you want to read it or or and when it's your turn or you want me to read okay, it. Okay, you can read it, Mary. So I'm sorry, and I think the party yeah, proponent has it. So yeah. anyways, Drew didn't know that I was no longer the chair, so he emailed it to me today. And, um, and it's, a, it's an update on the Conservation Commission's efforts to review this uh, proposal. It says, hi, Mary, and it's dated June 7th, 2023. Just wanted to provide you with some updates on the Conservation Commission's review of the proposed project at 275 Quinnaquisset Avenue. The Commission opened the hearing on this proposal at their May 4th, 2023 meeting. Matt Eddy from Baxter Nye Engineering presented the project, and there was subsequent discussion between the applicant and the commissioners. Ultimately, the commission voted to continue the hearing to June 15th and require the hiring of an independent consultant to review the notice of intent application and all supporting documentation. Since the May 4th meeting, I have gone through the town's uh, procurement procedures and solicited requests for quotes from four different environmental consulting firms. We received one response from LEC Environmental. This response will be reviewed by the commission at the June 15th meeting. After review, the commission will need to take a vote of endorsement to engage in a contract with LEC Environmental to conduct a peer review of the notice of intent application. This endorsement will then go to the town manager for securing a contract. All costs associated with this consultant peer review will be the responsibility of the applicant, signed Drew McManus, conservation agent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? I think you guys probably knew what you read just now anyways. Uh, I think you guys have done a pretty good job of responding to the requests that have been made. <clears throat> I, unlike Mary, I'm not, I'm, I'm comfortable with the buffer. Uh, I think it, it meets the needs and I think it satisfied the purpose. And I think you've responded in a very professional fashion and it looks to me like a very good project moving forward. Obviously you need environmental conservation support. I hope you get it. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, I think I'm very appreciative of all the work you've done. You've done a good job, and I think it looks good, and I'm hoping that we can do something positive going forward. Thank you. On the uh, Will Bend Special Permit modifications on that uh, <clears throat> paragraph 19, which conforms with Article 6, Section 174.24.C2, it's a lot to go through, and what I understand is we have to be able to answer every single issue that this will not cause excess demand on community facilities. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's huge. Will not significantly decrease surface or groundwater quality or air quality. 
that is one of the things I'm thinking about right now. Uh, will not have significant adverse impact on wildlife habitat. I don't know the first thing about it. Um, traffic flow, don't know waterways, fisheries, public lands, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to go through every one of them. And we're, I don't think, I'm definitely not capable of doing this. And I don't think anybody really is on the board except somebody who's an environmental specialist. So we're going to definitely wait. Um, have you concluded everything you want to say right now? Yes. OK, yeah. we have to wait to see what CONCOM's environmental expert says. And um, my concern, one of my big concerns is about this mitigation. Because I know, you, I think you said you had estimated a budget of $250,000 to do the cran turn the cranberry bogs into uh, wetlands. And, right. and there are two cranberry bogs, right, those two? Yeah, I mean, there's more than two out there, obviously, but yeah, we're yeah, doing but just two bogs. Two. Yeah, and, yeah. Th and that number, that was for, you know, one, two, and three, so the number's probably slightly less than that now since we would be doing only one and two. One and two, okay. That's what I understand. So, you know, I've been reading up on this subject, you know, on the Internet, <laughs> and it appears that um, it may not be as simple as I felt you said it was, and you don't really know until you get into it, and I, I understand about the different layers of, and yep. you know, you, I don't know if you plant anything on the shore and all of a sudden it grows by itself and now you've got a wetland, but it takes years. And then we have the issue of determining how we protect that, how this actually happens. Let's say it takes four or five years. We'd have to be monitoring that and probably with a performance bond, would you be willing to do that? Yes, yeah, you would. We, we've done that on other projects. Okay. It's essentially like a road bond. Right. And, you know, we understand that if, if we do the work, we have to stand behind it to make sure it takes. Yes. And, and also, too, just part of the conservation review, and I, I don't, don't know that I ever said that it was a simple process. That's why we brought up the cost, because it's fair, it is involved. I mean, to, to, there's a lot of work that has to occur, but that will be detailed through the Conservation Commission review process. And then they also, they have an automatic requirement of at least three years, and I could see it potentially yes. being five years, of a monitoring program for any time you do any type of mitigation, whether it's, you know, uh, wetland restoration or buffer plantings, et cetera. And, There's and always who, a monitoring. Who is it? Is it a, a arborist? Or, no, not an arborist. So who would, who would come out and check to see if you're moving Do, along? Depending on the type of mitigation being uh, performed, there is a, a, somebody who specializes in that. So you know, it probably would be for the, for the bogs. I would probably think it's going to would be Fuss and O'Neill that we would use. So that you know, from the commission standpoint, mm -hmm. they require the applicant to perform the monitoring uh, yes. uh, right. documents and, and perform that effort. You know, Willow Bend is responsible for hiring that person, paying for it. That information is provided to the commission over, a, again, a three to five year period. It's reviewed with Drew. It's reviewed with the commission as needed. If things are, you know, falling short, they have to be augmented, et cetera. So it's a, it's a process that's, you know, definitely established through uh, the Conservation Commission. And cor correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Fuss and O'Neill is working with the town of Mashpee yes. on another bog restoration project. So. Yeah, they're clearly qualified, and that, that's why we identified them as somebody who would be a good fit for this scope. Okay, I think we had one written call. Oh, no, it was not on, on, on this matter here. Um, any people who want to come up and... I think uh, you haven't finished your board members. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say anything? No, I'm good so far. Yes, All right. go ahead. I can live with the, the setback, but I have to have the conservation okay because that's my concern is if you restore this, what's going to happen and stuff. And you're on a septic system. You're not on a septic system. You're sewer, so we don't have to worry about nitrogen and phosphate going mm -hmm. into it. But, but my main concern is the conservation. And I gotta, I like them to come to a meeting while they're here. So we can right. Uh, That's what my plan is. Okay, good. If we get, I mean, they're they're doing different layers right now, is what I understand. A review and the ultimate with the biggest number, which you guys you are going to have to pay for, would be a, a a report, which we would like to have a report. It'd be nice to have them 
come here. Yeah. Or maybe it's not necessary. We'll just see. Yeah. As long and, as we have the report. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if I could, I mean, so, you know, the what we're trying to accomplish, and right, we have is a little bit of the the chicken and the egg, or the cart and the horse, however you want to look at it, as far as you know, reviewing with planning board, reviewing with conservation, and we're trying to dovetail the two of those together as best we can, and proceeding in hopefully the most you know efficient design process from Willowbend's standpoint, because of efforts and costs and so forth. So, you know, it's the same dialogue that we had at the conservation. Uh, Commission hearing, we opened it up. We said we knew this was not going to be a one hearing process. We said we're working with the planning board on revising the layout. We're going back to them on the 15th to we'll update them on this current layout. But my hope is that we can get to a point where we're getting this board's and then also conservation's comments that we're kind of landing in the same general area as, as you know, as to, okay, we're not, you know, the. We're fine with the layout aspects. We're fine with the buffer aspects, et cetera. And then we will complete the, again, that detailed grading stormwater effort that both this board needs to see and conservation needs to see. That, that's our hope. I mean, if we can't accomplish it that way, then we'll have to you know, deal with the planning board and conservation commission in the, in the manners that you see fit. But that's what we'll, we're trying we'll to accomplish. We'll come up with a way that's the most efficient okay. without compromising you know, yeah. quality. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Does that conclude your? Okay. Um, Dale. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to what the uh, Conservation Commission has to say, but um, I, I'm familiar with Fuss No Neil, and I've, uh, I've been on other projects that, uh, about this uh, bog restoration. I, I do like that a lot, and it, it does have it does have a great uh, many benefits to an uh, ecosystem on, on this scale. So, yeah, I'm, just, I'm looking forward to learning more about that with what uh, Fos No Neil and uh, Willowbend has in mind. I'm wondering if, if uh, Fos No Neil uh, has consulted any local uh, stakeholder groups on what will, will be in the uh, restored, this restored system. Do you know that yet? Uh, no, there's been no meetings with any, you know, stakeholders outside of just kind of the general, you know, presentations that we've done to this board and the, and the commission. Um, so. are, you, are you asking how it would be restored, the, yeah, how the mechanics, what it would look like? Uh, yeah, yeah I think, you know, we, we're open to that. Um, you know, obviously it's a severely altered right. ecosystem there and currently. You know, there's a lot of interest to be balanced, whether it's habitat and water quality, filtration, et cetera. So, uh, and yeah, they're very interesting, their preliminary discussions. They've said that, you know, once you scrape off the sand, even, you know, seed bank yeah, from seed bank. 40, 50 years right. ago is yes. still dormant. It will still come back, right. you know, yeah. it's, uh, it will. Right. which is truly amazing. But uh, so, yeah, we would. We'd welcome input on that. Rob? Yeah, I basically have four, four issues or, or concerns. Uh, one uh, first thing is the uh, four bay along the uh, Quinnequisset. Uh, you, you said you were going to do a uh, Cape Cod curve, curve up there. Would it be in the area of the four bay, or what is it? In, no, the, the, the Cape Cod berm falls right along the edge of the paved road. So all it is is a, it's just like a curb, right? Yeah, oh, I, I'm it's just familiar. a little rolled edge, and it's right on the edge of the pavement, right. which currently doesn't have one. So it just helps control and direct the runoff from the road so that you're not getting that whole soft shoulder area where you're getting the, you know, it turns into, you know, puddles and soft shoulder and erodes the edge of the road, et cetera, allows us to control that and then bring it to that four bay area so that okay. we can that, like, go that, through that the, tree, the pre treatment. Was, it's it's gonna direct it to the four bay yes. and not yeah. prevent it from Correct. entering the four bay. Correct, yeah, yeah, good. absolutely. Uh, the, the other concern is consistency of the uh, setback from the road, uh, the, the buffer zone. The, the rest of your org, uh, organization or the, the property has the 100 foot uh, setback and uh, for consistency, uh, 
I'm, I'm in favor of uh, maintaining that. The other thing uh, with the layout, I'm glad you have uh, wider roads and, and uh, a little more spacing in there. The issue I had was parking and access for emergency vehicles. On a busy weekend, everybody that can drive usually drives their own car, maybe with a passenger or two. And uh, it, it seems like parking is at a premium uh, there. I know across the street there's quite a bit of parking, but you know, I live in America and we park right in front of the door type of thing. So that's a concern that I, 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 as you go forward, maybe you could uh, address that concern. And the, uh, the bog restoration as well. I'm glad to hear that you are going to meander uh, instead of having a straight shot uh, stream. I, I walk the property and uh, that, that's a, a definite plus. And, and the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the mounds and mounding and whatever. But I, w I would like to see a plan jumpstart the natural occurrence either by additional plantings and not just letting it go from where it is to just, you know, whatever happens. Uh, where all of your units are, it's all wooded, a lot of treed area, a lot of bird uh, resting places. It'd be nice to have, most of all of that is gone because of the building and construction. Nice to have something else for the birds uh, to consider in the restoration area. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Public comment on this, on this particular issue. Do, you want to say, Do we have a, a list, of uh, Evan? Is there a list? The public hearing just step right off. Wendy? Thank you, Evan. Most of you know me, but for those who don't, I'm Wendy Williams. I am... Um, I'm a 35-year resident of Mashpee. I live at 249 Simons Narrows Road. And some of you know that my entire career has been devoted to two things, environmental issues and being a proponent of low-income people. Um, those are very important to me. I lived in Africa. I saw people die because of what happened to the environment there. And frankly, I'm horrified by this, really horrified. We've not taken care of our world very well. Anyone who went outside today and who looked up at the sky, which is all of us in this room, know that this is a fact. These fires that we're suffering from right now that are coming down from Canada are completely human engendered. We did it. We did it to our skies did it to our water. Anyone who watched Monday night's select board meeting will know for certain that we here have done our own damage. Here in Mashpee, we have let the overdevelopment go on too bloody long. It has to stop. Our little town and our mostly low-income residents are now having to cough up tens upon tens of millions of dollars to build sewers. In the immediate future, this financial burden is going to grow by leaps and bounds. We've only begun to see how much this sewer is going to cost us. And I'm not worried about it for us. I'm worried about it for the Wampanoag people, for the low-income people, for the people who are hourly wage earners. They can't afford these things. So why are you sitting here and even considering something like this? In the immediate future, this financial burden is going to grow by leaps and bounds. Good luck, town residents who can barely pay their bills now. Where do you see what's coming? Why? Why is this happening? Because of overdevelopment. No doubt about it. The sewer is not going to be a magic bullet. When I lived in Africa, I saw such degraded land. And I saw firsthand what happens to people forced to live in the context of environmental degradation. I saw children die before the age of five because the land was degraded. 
I saw people suffer from incurable diseases because the land was degraded. I myself pulled up water from the well and drank it with worms and other things in it. This is going to happen here. We think we're protected, but we are not. Look at the sky. We did that. We can't go out of our house today because the air is polluted. We did it. Look at the water. You can't go swim in the water. And we did that, and it happened because of overdevelopment. Here in Mashpee, we are in the midst of our own environmental degradation. If the sore is not going to the sore is not going to be a magic bullet, is there such a thing as a magic bullet? Yeah, there is. It's called nature. Nature is what protects us from disease, water infection, air pollution. So why are we talking about putting 12 units on five acres of land? This is insane. I can't believe that people who say they care about the environment think putting 12 units on five acres next to the water is an OK idea. It isn't. It's not OK. They have other land. They can build their 12 units somewhere else. They have other land, but they don't live here. They live somewhere else. So they don't suffer from the polluted water. They don't have to say, oh, I have to live here on Cape Cod in the winter, but soon I'll be able to go swimming in the ponds. We can't go swimming in the ponds anymore. This is awful. We, nature has natural limits, and we have abused those natural limits. We have expected that we could do whatever we want, build whatever we want, play as much as we want, drive obnoxious cars, do whatever, and the hell with it. It has to stop. Stuffing 14 acres on five, stuffing 14 units on five acres of seaside land, and now it's 12 units on five acres of seaside land, is absolutely outrageous, and it is suicidal. It is suicidal. This five acres needs to be set aside as conserved land. It should be conserved. It's on the water's edge. Why would we even consider allowing this? I can't believe it. This five acres needs to be made into conservation land, and I vote for it to be called the Mashpee Wampanoag Chief Vern Pocknet Forest Preserve. And we will honor the people who protected the land before we came and ruined it. That's how I think. The golf course folks can build these units in numerous other places where it will have a lot less of a degrading effect. Or they can decide that they've already built enough because there are 147 bedroom units over their permit. They can say, fine, we've done our job. We're going to wash our hands of it and walk away, or whatever they plan on doing when they're done building. That's 17 or 18 percent over the bedroom limit. And I know they knew it. I know they knew it. They can decide they don't need to do this anymore. It's not mandatory that they build these 12 units. If they cared about our town, they wouldn't build it. So now I have a few things I need to say about correcting the record here. Um, first of all, Drew McManus never said that he think this, thinks this project is an overall environmental benefit. I was at that meeting. He never said it. I know what Drew thinks, but I'm not going to speak for him. Go and call him and ask him what he thinks. If you're going to work on the bog, that's a great idea. But let's not work on a tiny percentage of the bog. Work on the whole thing. Work on all of Quaker Run. It surprised me to find out. I thought this would be a big project when I started talking to people. And it turns out that Willow Bend owns most of Quaker Run. So start to work on the whole bloody system. Don't tell me you're doing a good thing for me because you're destroying the land. And what, what is this, 20% of the bog? Commit to fixing the whole bog. So from my point of view, put that land in conservation. Then I'll go away. I won't come back. I won't bother you, Willow Bend, anymore. I know I'm annoying. I won't annoy you anymore. Or another trade-off, commit to fixing the entire bog. Now, that wouldn't be my first choice, but uh, that is the first choice of other people in town hall who I will not name, but you can do some phoning on your own and find out who they are. 
If you commit to, to fixing the entire bog, that would be an overall environmental benefit. This is not. Moreover, there are a couple of other things that you're out of compliance with in the permit. I was told yesterday by someone who knows a lot about the history of this permit that um, there are supposed to be all kinds of public ways that one th run through this property and that there are supposed to be signs saying that there are public ways. Those signs aren't there. So I would like the board to address that. The public needs to know that they are welcome to walk through there. It's hidden now. It's a, apparently it's kind of technically there, but it's sneaky. The public is supposed to be told, you can walk through here. There might be a gate. It might look like you're not welcome because you don't have enough money to live here. But actually, you can go for a walk here. So that's my ranting. And I'm not going to go away and wait for all of this to happen and for people to say, it's OK to build 12 fancy pantsy units for people who don't even live here and pollute our water even more, because it's not OK. Good evening, Arden Russell, Sturgis Lane. Um, this land is not an appropriate location for dense residential development. What it is is a very environmentally sensitive parcel that's surrounded by wetlands. This proposed development is on a parcel of land that is 30% wetlands. Five of the units are proposed to be constructed within the wetlands, and 10 of the units will be within the 50-foot buffer. Voters just increased the setback to 150 feet from a wetland because we know the importance of protecting our wetlands. This is where the rubber meets the road. We can't just put strategies on paper and then not implement them. The voters want 150 feet from the buffer. This proposal will not improve the environmental health of our community. Thank you. Anyone else? No one else? <clears throat> Terry Ronhawk, I'm at 104 DeGrasse Road. And um, I know I spoke at the first, well, the May meeting about, um, so the catch basins, I know there's another word for them that's far fancier than that. And I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a, a conservationist and I'm not an environmental. And I know the conservation committee is working hard on this as the planning board is. But, um, and I pointed this out at the other meeting and I just want to make another point about it is that yes, these units will be s set up through the um, Willow Bend um, sewer system. That's understood. But the um, basins that will be catching the runoff from the fertilization and the roofs and the, they, they, these, these will be leached into the ground, if, is my understanding. This, these will not be treated. They will be leached into the, into the, um, into the groundwater. So anything that fertilization or fertilizing uh, or, you know, uh, the runoff from the roadways will be leached right into the groundwater. That's not treated. So, um, and I understand that, you know, you're making some effort to take care of the side of the road there um, and that um, basin there that will be catching the water coming off Quinnequisset, which, you know, is, is treated. It's, it's tr a treated road. But that's water that will be just leached into the groundwater. And, you know, as we talk about our, um, you know, our water and water quality, the more water that we leach into this groundwater that we that is shared is 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 important. So I just want to point that out. And I know that, like I said, people that are far more knowledgeable about this are um, are looking at the whole project and looking at the the impact. But you know, citizens who are just living in the town and looking at the water quality are also concerned about things like that, like things leaching into the groundwater. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So um, I think this is the time that we'd ask to continue the meeting 
continue this public hearing for another time. And Jack, you said something about two weeks for that <laughs> second public yes, hearing. I, is that a good time, or should yeah, we? Yeah, I think we should do the. You want to do it, even that. though the CONCOM will not be ready. No, I, I, I think we can uh, handle them both together I, I, at the same night. And, you know, recognizing that we're not going to be complete, obviously, until we make further progress with conservation. Okay, so you want to do it on the 21st? Is it the? Yeah. June 21st, 20, yeah. June 21st, same time? Yes. So it'll be, the public hearing will be noticed for uh, on the agenda for both matters yes as separate yes okay. <coughs> and everybody can make it uh well because we have five we have to be careful about who misses what okay so yes. is there anybody on this board that won't be here no okay, okay. God you, willing. pardon me Live god Live willing <laughs> <laughs> all right okay seven ten what do you want to say? Are we going to talk about the bedrooms and stuff on the That's next meeting? That's what we're going to talk about at the oh, next right, meeting. Yeah, and I just, I know we're not supposed to talk about that now because it's I, not I noticed. I just want to make sure this yes. look Yeah, we're talking about bedrooms, yes. Right. Okay, 710, both uh, 12 units and the 853 bedrooms Correct. issue. Bear in mind, Madam Chair, the 710 public hearing for if you were to continue this public hearing to 710 on the 21st that is fine the, the bedroom per application is a separate proceeding it is noticed at for 715 and they'll be dealt 715 with correct really Which, yeah, yes. two, if we can't two. complete it at 715 it doesn't matter no 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 you might have to open it and continue it to a later time continue it for a later time practice, well why don't we make it like 720 i mean i don't know if you're going to do this That's in 10 right. minutes or 725 you t what would you like jack um, well, we decide. We decide. That I know we decide, but I'm I'm asking them. I don't think that this is an issue that I have to make a big deal about. Yeah, we're we're, we're flexible. Whatever we'll works. Okay. Seven, let's let's say seven twenty. Seven twenty on the bedrooms. You want a motion? Karen, just, just, just I would a, like a motion. Just a quick point. Yes. If we if the first public hearing is at seven fifteen and the next one's at seven twenty and we have a light agenda, we might be sitting here on our sitting on our hands for that first fifteen minutes. All right, to so open. you're saying go seven fifteen. I would suggest go set schedule this continuance okay. for seven ten. I hear 7 you. Seven ten and then the next one for seven fifteen. Okay, I understand because we can continue the second one. And so you could continue this to seven ten on the twenty third. Now, I guess one point is, you know, you want to resolve or at least begin deliberation on the twenty first relative to that bedroom question and it would be backwards if you will if you were to um open it at oh. 710 so there might be benefits all right to wait so till i think maybe the bedroom question should since we've already they've already made the basic presentation on the 12 units we do the bedrooms first and the oh you gotta do this one yeah, go ahead with 720 that, bedroom, we'll make sure that the agenda may is be determinative really about decision all we making have to do is continue we open the meeting up and continue it, and we can still talk about the first public hearing. Right. Okay. So it's okay, going to so be. So we motion for uh, seven ten for the public hearing. Public ten. Either way, it doesn't necessarily matter. It's just pro I need to notice it appropriately in the agenda. Motion to continue the public hearing until seven ten. Seven ten, and then you're going to make another motion for the other for the seven fifteen article that. I thought that was already on. That's already on. Then we say seven. Do you want to say one motion? Needed right now to continue this proceeding it's until right seven ten. Yeah. That's what I just said. Dennis okay. is just t saying at our next meeting next. you have to manage it, but just right. I got it. one motion. Okay. We have the motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now you can make the other motion. Okay. Not necessary. The, no. That hearing's already scheduled and it's already, already scheduled. Oh, all right. Okay. Great. So if the bedroom it comes first, and then the twelve units. No, no. no. This comes first. This comes first. Don't worry. Seven ten is right. adequate for my purposes. Okay. We will appropriately okay. run that meeting. Right. At that time. Okay, guys, go to bedroom. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Mary. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about what's going on with the Charter Review Committee? Sure. Oh, so um, what's 
the, the number one thing you have to know about the Charter Review Committee is we're having our first public hearing on June 20th at 6.30. And I want everybody to come. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> it's going to be here. It's going to be live broadcast from Mashpee TV. Um, but it's a really big deal. We review the charter every 10 years. And um, we have to have at least one public hearing. The uh, chair, who is John Miller, who is also our moderator, um, has committed to more than one public hearing. But this is our first public hearing. And, and, and uh, we're working hard, so we really need to hear from the public. So in your packet, you were provided with um, a copy <coughs> of the charter. Um, what we're doing on the Charter Review Committee is we have divvied up the work. Um, so each one of us has taken an article um, to discuss at length with the Charter Review Committee, um, taking comments uh, and you know getting to understand each one. So David Whedon did Article 1. Um, uh, big news uh, is that something really big changed since the charter was um, first adopted in 2004, and that is now we have a federally recognized tribe. So um, luckily we had a citizen of the tribe on the Charter Review Committee who remembered that, and while reviewing Article 1, um, noted that we should probably have a preamble to explain that because our town is very different than other towns in the Commonwealth because of this. And also that in, our, in the section 1-1 in incorporation, it talks about the United States government and that perhaps because the tribe is a sovereign nation that that should be noted there as well. So that was, that was really good. David did a good job. Um, we also have gone through uh, Article 2 and part of Article 3. And um, what I passed out um, is very draft minutes um, from one of our meetings. And you can see I have scribbles all over it. But it kind of gives you a flavor of what we're going to be uh, looking at. Um, we're, you know, sometimes we're looking at typos, references uh, to, to other sections that are no longer there, definitions that don't make any sense. Um, um, I brought up, you know, uh, the town clerk with our town clerk, who is a an elected official, but is a hardworking employee also, um, who has told me that she might be retiring. You know, what do we do with that position? Do we keep it as an elected position, or do we want to consider it for an appointed uh, position? Um, town clerks, um, it's a, it's, uh, it used to be the only um, position for a town was the town clerk and that's why they were elected um, but now it's a profession with you know classes you can take certificates you can take so it's it's just something to think about um, um, that kind of stuff Mary could you um, as you're going through this could you explain the procedure you said David Whedon uh, David look, had yeah wait wait, wait let me one. ask the question David Whedon uh, uh, worked on article <clears throat> one so did, does the does the committee vote on? Not yet. No, they're not voting, but I mean, mm -hmm. they they like what he's saying and they're considering it. We're putting every, we're brainstorming at this point. Yep, we're okay. brainstorming. Um, most things that have been brought up have been, have made it to the minutes. Okay. Yep. So, so when you bring this for um, public meeting on June 20th, it's just like a workshop like we have with LCP. I, I think it's going to be much more of a listening session. Okay. Right? So, um, right, our meetings are public. If somebody saw something or heard something at one of the meetings and they want to talk about it on June 20th, that's welcome. But it's more, you know, as you read the charter, what are your initial thoughts about the charter? Yeah, we're brainstorming at this point okay. um, and asking for clarification. There, there are some definitions. I think the, I think the word town officer um, is randomly through the charter. I think that used to, uh, that should have, in some places, should have been replaced by town clerk. Do you know what I mean? There's like, there's some things, there's some words that kind of are 
weren't changed appropriately okay. at some point. Um, it is a it is a good document. I'm not saying that, but um, I did bring up you know the thing about um, if you're an elected official, can you still can you be appointed to a, another committee? It was received with Luke. It was it, the reception was lukewarm. So the people that are passionate about it that have a story to tell need to come on the 20th and tell that story. I did introduce the concept of maybe if there's a if there's chronic vacancies, that the board of selectmen could waive that rule. Oh, you know idea. what I mean? Yeah. Um, because it really was. It's in the spirit of lots of people being involved in our local government, and that's what we want. But, um, you know, I remember when on the Affordable Housing Committee, this was like 10 years ago, there was chronic vacancies on that committee. And I offered to sit on it temporarily until, you know, they got another person and they couldn't because of the charter. But if we put in a provision that's kind of said, well, the select board can waive that if it considers there's a chronic vacancy. Something like that. Yeah. Mary, you, you said there... You're going to have one public hearing. So the public comes to give their opinion. Yeah. And you're all going to all sit down and take whatever the public says. Yeah. Are we going to, are you going to come back to the public before it goes to town meeting? I, so, oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to make I have a feeling that then that will all be kind of compiled. And then we'll start seeing what, what we can push forward, if any changes at all. All right. right? There was talk about have doing a survey. Yeah, that's a good idea. I said, oh, I know somebody who has a survey monkey account. You know. <laughs> it's a library's account, so how I've become the primary user. <laughs> you remember the password probably, right? <laughs> so, um, there's that. Um, they're not rushing. They're not right. saying, okay, we want it done by this time, and we don't have to rush. The only thing we have to do is hold the public hearing within 30 days of the start of the process, of the convene, the first meeting that we convened within 30 days of that date, we have to have the public hearing. That's why it's so soon. Okay. But John Miller, who is our chair, he has committed to doing a series of public hearings. Good, good. So you're not saying like the deadline is October for the town meeting? Could no. Could be the spring, could be a year? Oh, not right. I, I mean, I'm hoping it's done in a year just because we're meeting weekly. Okay. <laughs> You're meeting weekly. Oh, okay. So well, that says it's, that, it's voluminous and it's complicated. Right. Yeah. Well, yes, and it's really helping going through section by section by section right. because, um, I mean, there were some sections that were actually reading out loud um, to get through it. Yeah. So we're meeting um, next Tuesday at 630, and then the, uh, so that's the 13th. And then also the public hearing is the 20th at 6.30. I forget so how many meetings come. we had last time, but there was a lot of them. There was a lot of them, yeah. So do you have any comments now besides the one that you no, brought forward? No, I want to read it. Yes. And, and, and I, you know, we I'm, have um, a web page that's been updated on the website. There's a special email Oh, gosh, I failed. To, I didn't write it down. But on the website for the Charter Review Committee, there's a special uh, email for comments. So feel free. Actually, that's a really great way to make comments. You can still come and have public uh, comment. You can give, you know, you can come and talk to us. But um, really, when you put stuff in an email, it's documented. And it's really nice and easy for how, us. How is the Charter Committee made up of? Different people from who, who are yeah. the people on the right. charter committee? So it's in here. There are there are nine people. Yeah. Okay. So there's one from the planning board, okay. who's me. Two from the select board, and that's David Whedon and Carol Sherman. Two from the school committee, and right now that's Kathy West and Don Myers. Oh, uh, yeah. I see okay. That. And. Two, yeah, finance committee. You, oh, two from the finance committee, which is Darlene Furbush and Greg McKelvey. Okay. And then two at large, oh, good. who is, uh, they're appointed by the town moderator, and the town moderator appointed himself, John Miller, and Rodney Collins, okay. who's our town manager, and that's actually been very helpful because um, when we get to the point 
when we're talking about uh, the warrant and closing the warrant and all of that, there's very strict times yeah. that things have to happen. And so it was very con it was very e have, convenient yeah. to have the town manager there because we we said, is five business days really enough for your staff to get that? And he said, oh no. So he's going to be working with his staff to make sure that we don't have, you know, don't for know. us five business days sounds easy, but when you're compiling a, a warrant that has to be letter perfect, mm. and you're oh, doing yeah. lots of other stuff in your office, right? Taking phone calls from Mary Wigan, right? <laughs> so, you know, you you need a little bit. So he, they're going to figure out, make sure the time frame of everything is right. Okay. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Um, let's see. Is Mr. Morin here? Jacques yes. is not here. Pardon me? You He's not in the room. No. Okay. Uh, the uh, Declaration of Default Aquay Highlands Tripartite Agreement Dated March 20th, 2019. So I, have an I, update. I do have an update. Um, I'm going to give you what I would consider the progress first. I received a couple of emails later today that included some images that I do think are important for you to see. So I'm going to show you those second. Um, but I, I spoke with Ed today, Ed Pesci, uh, who has been in contact with Lawrence Lynch, the paving contractor. Lawrence Lynch prepped the site last Friday for paving and uh, also shot grades and elevations and identified with clarity um, the flat spots that are resulting in the drainage in front of 86 Blue Castle Drive. Um, and Ed's, um, Ed's still in Florida dealing with his ISU, but his um, subcontractor engineer, Brad, uh, will be meeting Lawrence Lynch on site tomorrow um, to get firm clarity with regard to what Ed's expectations are for Lawrence Lynch to complete the top coat of pavement as you've asked him to do. Um, what did you just say? Add the top coat and what? Top coat of pavement. Yeah, so Ed, the, Ed's associate engineer will be meeting right. the contractor yeah. on site tomorrow to make the final plan and get approval to proceed with the top coat of, coat of pavement. Um, so that is good. Um, I am uh, just a, a few minor updates that are conservation related. Um, Karen and I drove around <coughs> Blue Castle Drive to just, I wanted to walk through the conditions of the permit with her, identify her between the differences with the tripartite agreement and the special permit and just associate her with some of the obligations as they relate to the documents. Um, and we met the assistant conservation agent on site while he was there um, inspecting the, the violations that he had identified and had submitted a letter <coughs> to the board for. Um, since that time, the, I know the, there are three issues. One, the construction trailer. Um, I, is the construction trailer still there? Yes. The trailer's still there. I know it has been listed for sale. Yes. Um, I've seen that ad. I'm hoping that, uh, that will be taken care of in short order, but I'll need to get a further update from Dan in that regard. Um, the Bobcat skid steer in the back, yeah. I believe has been pulled off of conservation property yeah. and the, the trees has required were planted. Um, so there's some of the progress. Um, but I want to show you, if it's okay, Madam Chair, on the computer, a few images that were sent to me today yes. that I think are um, just important for us to consider as we move through proceeding of this process. Particularly, some of these things I, I, I might urge the board to consider referring to the building commissioner for potential zoning enforcement, because we're dealing with subdivision-related matters. Are you talking about maintenance issues? I'm going to show you okay. uh, now. So part of this is um, there was prep of the site required today. They had to you know, cut the edge of the grass to expose the edge of pavement. Um, normal to do with a little notice to the neighbors to expect such a thing. Um, it wouldn't be so unreasonable. But I'm just, I just want to show you the condition okay. that it was left in today. Gonna come up on that. I'm gonna show you on this. I received them just before this meeting, so I wasn't able to print them for you. So this is how it was left today. Well, that's not acceptable. So the grass was removed, but left on everyone's front lawn. I just think that's somewhat unprofessional and undecent. That's one issue. Um, and I, I, I would seek the board's input on how we might want to address this with Mr. Moran. Uh, second, 
Um, just as the existing condition of the material stockpile. Um, and what might concern you the most, which I think I would like to refer to the commissioner if there's some enforceable action, is the dirt pile of children climbing on yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that runs off into those wheels. That's correct. So these, uh, so there was progress made as the board directed, but <coughs> there is a certain lack of professional decency and courtesy to the neighborhood that I'd like to evaluate appropriate channels to rectify. Yep. It's like a total, well, it's like this, a total lack. This of lacking in maintenance has nothing to do with what we're looking at with the no. tripartite agreement. So he is, right now, he is working toward compliance with that. So I, I think I, I would certainly like to urge the board to uh, stay the course with regard to getting the subdivision related issues up to snuff. There remain conditions of the special permit, particularly the maintenance of the unimproved portion of Blue Castle Drive that need to be con regularly evaluated. I do want to ensure that we get this paving issue accomplished. The Dorseys no longer have to deal with this drainage problem. Um, but the, 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 the quality and condition that the neighborhood has left in concerns me. Um, it is not, in my opinion, overly challenging to cut grass and leak, remove it from the site or to remove material from the site that may be a potential hazard. Um, it's inexcusable. We deal with a lot of developers in this town, and this is not an issue anywhere else. No. Um, and so I just I wanted to bring this to your attention and seek your guidance on how you'd like me to address it with Mr. Moore. You should, be there, told, they should be told to clean it up. It's, it's inexcusable. If you oh. clean that grass off or you clean that ripped up grass off, there's just soil underneath it, there's, there's nothing. Uh, where they cut the, ed, ed, to expose the edge yeah. of pavement? Yeah. Well, it just, it would be sod. Can't and they give a, can he be asked him to put a clean edge on there with well, sod? Presume the, the appropriate way if to do the, in my opinion, to do the work would have been to cut that edge clean with a power tool and remove the material from the site. It's but simple. With a power tool that would have been a straight. Even if it wasn't a power tool, even don't a shovel, leave the dirt straight. in people's Jeez. yards. That's just not nice. Well, the building so, commissioner will handle that. I, I, you know, that's, you know, I'm not sure there's a building code or a zoning enforcement related matter there. That is just uncourteous and unprofessional. Um, the material stockpiles and the potential safety hazards, I think, may be something we could address mm -hmm. um, under uh, a bylaw or or some enforceable code. I, let, that, I need to evaluate this. In law, but. that would be called an attractive nuisance. Yeah. It would get kids to want to climb on that. And somebody could fall in and suffocate. So I'm going to be referring these photographs with the boards. You know. So I make a motion that we refer these three photographs through the town planner to the building commissioner and the director of health for <sighs> enforcement of safe, of um, health and safety code. Okay. That'll be. How do you vote? Aye. 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 Would that be powerful enough? That will work for me. <laughs> okay. Never, never before, Jeez. those wheels were filled up with water. Yeah. And I saw the little kids playing. I was thinking, well, if one of those little kids fell in that, that water, it was probably four or five feet deep, you know? And I hope they're cleaned out. They haven't. I haven't did receive checked. confirmation that the basins were cleaned out. I received photos. I mean, the, there was progress made elsewhere. Plug one hole, but it's just you know this. Yeah. It's it is kind of so getting ridiculous. And what about so the, the conservation first, agent? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Next, what about the first part from Great Neck Road south, <clears throat> the gravel part up to Blue Castle? That's not within our purview. Well, That's it is a, within your purview as a special permit condition. Okay. So, um, it is Mr. Moran's position that he's met his obligation. I think the board, I. The planning department's position is that he is not. I don't know if the board has voted in that regard, but. Um, so, all right, so where is that in the special permit? If you go to uh, public safety mitigation, move this condition 10. Pardon me for throwing these out. Yeah. Traffic mitigation, public safety mitigation. 10. Right at the bottom there. 10. Condition 10. So per the applicant's agreement to do so, the portion of Blue Castle Drive between the project and Great Neck Road mm -hmm. South shall be maintained on an annual basis at the expense of the applicant. 
or the proposed Aquay Highlands Homeowners Association Incorporated once it is established by grading so as to preserve the crown of the road and the swales on each side as depicted in the cross-section detail shown on the approved plans so that it continues to provide the roadway capable uh, the roadway capable of supporting fire apparatus in all weather conditions as specified in the previous condition. Maintenance of Blue Castle Road also includes inspection and cleaning as necessary of the drainage facilities located on the northerly side of Blue Castle near the intersection with Great Neck Road South. Okay, my question is how many houses are built now and how many are remaining to be built? I believe there's 10 built and four remaining. Can the neighborhood confirm that? Okay. And the <coughs> the HO the, the, eight, let me finish. the HOA is in force now. Do they have meetings? No. The HOA, I don't believe. My, the, the last communication I had relative to the HOA was that Mr. Moran extended an invitation to the neighborhood's, neighborhoods, neighborhood to participate and establish the association, an invitation they rejected based on these issues. Would it be a fair statement, sir, that uh, you have not maintained that gravel part from Great Neck Road South up to your Blue Castle line there. Yes, in that the last is accurate. Three years. Yes, that is accurate. First of all, Tom McNabb, 58 Blue Castle Drive. So I'm part of the HOA. Oh, you are. Um, which has not really been fully taken over. I think at, at this point, there are seven houses of the 14 that are occupied. There are three lots that are unsold as of today, and one house that Jacques Morin built that is also unsold. So he had tried to set up a meeting about a week or so ago, maybe two weeks ago, to essentially, from our view, try to pawn off a lot of this discussion to the homeowners, uh, of, which, of which he never disclosed we were going to be responsible for the road, et cetera. There were too many open issues with the trailer, the dirt mountain, the junk pile, the swales that didn't work, the clogged drains the road that's falling apart, et cetera, et cetera. And we said, time out. You know, I've been on HOAs before. I said, no, it's too early to turn that over just because you want to get out of this. So, so the homeowners do not, they're not running anything at this point. Um, the road has not been maintained. Um, I actually went out the other day and painted an orange circle around one of the deepest potholes because it's, it's dangerous. Someone's going to get hurt or they're going to break their car or their leg. Um, you, I mean, you can, if you look at, the print or the document, which again, we found out, as homeowners found out after we moved in, that he never disclosed. We actually, fortunately, got, I think, through Evan. Um, he hasn't done any of that. Look, look at the print, look at the drawings, look at the descriptions, and then drive on the road. Um, I would advise not doing it at night because you could really get hurt or damaged. Um, but no, he hasn't maintained that. And again, the, the dirt pile, the junk pile, the trailer, none of that's happening. So. Um, he, he seemingly rarely shows up to the site, mm -hmm. and so I'm not sure if he's checked out, if he's done in his mind or whatever, but there's still several, I think three or three, two, three houses that some people have been waiting almost two years for to move into, and he just, he never has anyone showing up. So it, it sort of has gone into a kind of a pause, at least from our perception, those of us who have been there a couple of years now. So. Um, Again, that's well, uh, I think that language, that first sentence, would you read that first sentence again, Mary? Per the applicant's agreement to do so, the portion of Blue Castle Drive between the project and Great Neck Road South shall be maintained on an annual basis at the expense of the applicant. Okay. I would encourage well, all of you to drive up there. If you have seen you in the neighborhood, I'm thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. And, yeah. and Mary, I think you've been through there. Yeah. Evan, I think, has too. Uh, but I'd encourage you, if you haven't, just... Again, I would encourage you to do it in the daytime because it's, it's really a dangerous road. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's partial cruddy pavement and it's mostly sand and dirt on the I've sides there, I saw it. and I jagged edges. And there's a monster pothole up near the fire hydrant about halfway up. You really got to be careful of because it's, cool. it's deep. Go on a rainy day and go up there. Yeah, that's even more dangerous. Yeah. Rainy day or at night, it's, it's really bad. Someone's going to ruin their rims for sure. Um, so again, that, that hasn't been, if that's considered maintenance, then uh, that's, I've never seen such poor maintenance in my life. Well, how do uh, we compel this performance? Well, I, I mean, I just want to also identify one other, it's not just the pavement that's supposed to be maintained. There are two swales, swales on yeah. either side of the road, yeah, right. 
where they, specifically a crown was supposed to be maintained on the road to direct the sheet and flow the into the yeah. swales. There's no evidence of any maintenance of the no. swales. No. And that's, that's and required by 10. It is. There's no evidence, leaves. no. That's correct. So that's, that condition identifies a particular detail on a sheet of the subdivision plan. Yep. And so I... I How do we compel it to be enforced? Well, Don't we, give out occupancy permits. You know, the bill inspector until he fixes all them. I think that was in there actually it actually said said that somewhere in there but that didn't that didn't stop me as far as I know uh, Jacques Morin has no intent desire or uh, thinks he owns any of that road so and and from his view I think he believes he maintained it to some degree but again anyone who's driven on that that's it's not a maintained road so and, and our our engineer concurs with this Yes, yes, absolutely. I think, um, you know, you are the permit granting authority, but you're not the enforcement agent. This, the, the, this is a zo um, the zoning enforcement officer is the enforcement agent, the building commissioner. Um, similarly to the re referring these photographs to him, I, I might suggest oh, we okay. identify this condition of the permit um, and note our concerns in a letter uh, requesting evaluation of the condition or the, of that particular condition for compliance, noting that your concerns that it is non-compliant. I'd make a motion. Go ahead, Mary. I'd make a motion um, that the planning board refer uh, public safety mitigation condition number 10 of the special permit decision for BCDM LLC, Aqua Highlands, recorded on June 11th, 2014, in Barnstable County Registry of Deeds 28191, page 307, to the building commissioner for enforcement. Second. Oh, good. Aye. Okay. Um, oh, wait, this got is that strong enough? That'll work yeah. for me. I, yes. Second. I second. How, how many say aye or no? Aye. Aye. Unanimous? Yes. Aye. Yes, right. Thank you. Um, do we have to authorize the uh, town engineer to work with the building commissioner on that? Um, we have a budget to, for Ed to manage this project. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. Now we're, we were coming to, <laughs> to our bylaws. Jeez, that's terrible. Hmm? That's terrible. Do uh, you want to tell us where you are on, on that? Well, let me ask Mike first. We're talking about the solar bylaws. Sure. Initially, you were interested in uh, an overlay in the residential area? Yes. For bylaw. Have you done any thinking on that? Or are you still? Um, I haven't changed my thoughts on it. You haven't changed your mind. Okay, I'll wait I'm not minutes. against what we had proposed, for You're sure. You're not against what I'm we proposed? I'm not against what we had proposed. I thought we should probably take an opportunity, and I was in line with what Evan was thinking, to use some of the land that might not be used for residential to go further on solar, but I can't okay. argue with what we've done so far. So you, you do like the bylaw as written? No, but I'm ex I'll accept but, it, but, but I don't like it. it. No. How, how many, oh, well, let's see. We make a motion to accept the bylaw as written without the solar bylaw as written without any overlay in the residential zone. Well, ultimately, what, what, what was asked was uh, if, if the board was interested in pursuing an alternate pathway in addition to or to supplement the existing bylaw, that would be in the form of an overlay district, presumably. I have not had the capacity to produce that draft and do the work yet uh, to prepare that draft. So ultimately, I think the question is, do you how urgent is evaluating the solar bylaw for an old overlay? Because it, you know, from a staff position, um, the, the bylaw approved by the last town meeting uh, achieved it, will achieve its purpose and in, intent um, and puts the, the, the use and expands the use through alternate zoning districts. Um, uh, my ability it, right now in this minute in time to do the work required to to, do, to flesh out an overlay is very, very limited. So I'd prefer to prioritize the other articles at this minute in time over the solar overlay. And if, if we had, if this came up for discussion again, we could always do an amendment. At least we could yeah. get this. The board at any time, at any town meeting can propose amendments to its zoning bylaw, whether it be solar or otherwise. So I, I just, I wanna keep my eyes, I'd like to fo focus on um, the immediate most pressing priorities um, that are not just regulatory related, but also are long-term planning related. We, I'm running four long-term planning processes right now. Right. And, uh, 
okay. and I'm still alone. Uh, so I, I'd prefer to defer the solar bylaw. Okay. So we should pass a motion to give you more time or something? I don't even need a motion. I just want to, I just want everyone to be aware of my existing of of the of uh, the capacity limitations in my office in consideration of um, the priorities moving ahead, um, and, and let, allow you to discuss whether or not you want to proceed with an overlay at all in the short term. Well, it's, uh, I, I I suggest that the that that we table the matter until the next round of uh, the next opportunity to submit amendments to the zoning bylaw. We're not going to make this deadline, no, which is not. July 10th. Okay. So we should table this and, 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 and bring it back up in the winter, right? December is when we start to work on um, yep. January the January. stuff because that's due in February. February, right? February, yeah. yeah. I would okay. agree. I, would, I, think that, I agree with that. I think it's a good idea. So make a motion. Around please. Thanksgiving, remind us. I'll remind you. <laughs> You can just table it as a motion to table uh, any consideration for an overlay. A solar bylaw overlay in the residential zones. She has the power to table it. Madam Chair, you have the power to We don't have to file a motion. No. You table it. I'm tabling it till the winter season. That's your first big thing there. Good job. Executive decision. I love it. Okay. So the next one is the accessory apartment zoning bylaw amendment, which I don't. The copy that I we have did. Did you say you got one? You finally. I got have one? it. I have. I have the. Uh, yeah. Okay. I I I, I don't know um, if um, how the comments we received some public comment on it, and I'm not sure how that fits. Oh, in. okay. Can, let me. I can let enumerate me. that for you. Okay. Um, I did so. The uh, there are three articles. They're set because we're modifying three small subsections of the bylaw. So I, I wrote them just as three separate articles to give to the council. Um, one is the modification of subsection A, which clearly identifies, you know, property owner, what an owner is LLC, <laughs> the whole thing. Right. Um, and this is the section that uh, allows a property owner um, to either live in their home and rent out the ADU, or the accessory apartment, or live in their accessory apartment and rent their house. Um, so and adds the language that under no circumstances may the property owner rent two tenants for both units at the same time. Right. So that's one article. Uh, the second article modifies subsection C of the accessory apartment bylaw that removes the ratio uh, delineation, whereas the maximum size of the ADU is uh, associated with a ratio of gross floor area to the principal dwelling. It's no longer proposed as 40% of the gross floor area of the principal dwelling. It just sets a firm cap of 900 square feet yeah. as the maximum and establishes a minimum of 300 square feet. And then a modification. This the, your, la your last meeting we contemplated <laughs> modifying the uh, the <laughs> term for which the minimum term for which the ADU can be rented. Um, we, you had contemplated, I think, 90 or so days. Okay, That's what this says. Um, I received written comment from Arden Russell, which you have in your packets, making um, similar suggestions with a few deviations. I did not incorporate these comments into my drafts yeah. because you hadn't had an opportunity to consider them. Right. But I would say I've reviewed the comments and I have no issues with the proposed comments. Do we? I want to read that into uh, a couple. I guess a couple. Um, Arden suggests in her letter, uh, similarly establishing a maximum square footage, which we've we've done. Um, further, um, she suggests, which does, it is not included in this draft, a modification to subsection I of the current bylaw, adding language that currently we don't allow boarding or lodging in the ADU. She suggests in expanding that language to. In, uh, <coughs> to take into consideration also the principal dwelling. That provision is not currently added in the bylaw, not something that we've considered yet. Um, and further, she recognizes in her letter that the purpose and intent of the bylaw itself, its passage to go from special permit to a by right, was to encourage year-round rental housing. So she suggests a minimum rental period of 12 months. Um, I, it's currently, again, 90 days, as you contemplated at your last meeting. Um, 
so those are the differences between her letter and I put it to you to 12 discuss. months would wipe out the Airbnb business. Well, Airbnbs are not allowed for the ADUs anyway. Um, but 12 months, we d you were contemplating a, la you know, a shorter term period for you know, the se seasonal workforce. Seasonal yeah, workforce, right. Um, yeah. But I think you know, Arden's point is that the purpose and intent of the bylaw is for year-round rental housing. So do we want... That, that's the consideration for the no, I like, I, 12 months or you shorter. Like, you like 12 months? Yeah. yeah I do All too. right, let's go for it. So who enforces this though? Like, say my neighbor, the, the, Tony built an accessory apartment. Yeah. And we were told he was going to rent it out B&B, &B, you know? Yep. But how do we enforce that? I mean, I'm not going to know. You won't know. So we do actually know. Um, if, any, if, if someone lists a, 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 any, any property in Mashpee on the regular short-term rental websites, we get notified. Right. Yeah. Um, and you're required to uh, get inspected and, and registered with the Board of Health. Um, so if someone were to regist not register their ADU and put it on Airbnb, for example, we would know and that would be enforceable by the building commissioner after an <coughs> inspection by the code compliance officer. Because like, when I get my permit, I have to tell you I'm putting the accessory apart. Yes. So do they come out once a year to make sure somebody's been living there for a year? There, there's a requirement for anyone with an accessory apartment to prove on an annual basis based on the last, the, okay. the issuance date of the building permit yeah. that they still occupy the premises. Right now, the principal dwelling. Um, the, the purpose of this is to help people get a living space. Correct. You know, some way to right. live, yes. Know. Well, I guess the only question I have is uh, I'm okay with the time frame, but if we're concerned about the seasonal workers and we're concerned about places to house people who come down for seasonal work, are we not eliminating that entirely by eliminating a 90-day limitation? I mean, that, isn't, I think, that, isn't that important? I, I think, well, I think, I think it's important. It, it, there are pros and cons, right? I mean, I think anyone, whether if you're a seasonal worker and you're looking for somewhere to live down here, you're adding pressure to the marketplace for year-round workers. Right. So, I mean, it's a balance. Make it five months. Make it a little bit longer, but you know. Well, it, the purpose of the ADU by law is to is to create permanent year-round housing. Yeah. And that's that's not what workforce housing necessarily is. Right. right. So I think we should try it and see what happens. What twelve months? Yeah. Yeah. Because we too. can always change it if we start to see a lot of violations for J one visa students or something like that. Then um, I'd, I'd address it. But I, I it is true. It, it, the purpose of the bylaw is to produce year-round housing. Um, can I make one other comment? I think I mentioned in the letter that um, to change, it seems simple, but to change the word may rent to shall mm. rent, um, because if you don't say they shall, shall rent it, they can rent. use it for guest accommodations or family, and you know they're building ADUs and not using it for housing purposes because it only says they may rent it. It doesn't say they have to rent it. The word shall is mandatory for that purpose. Is, is that in one of these articles? Nope, I didn't, I didn't incorporate any of Harden's comments just because I wanted you to discuss them first and establish a direction for so me. So I'm, I'm happy with that change. I am too. We're, yeah, I just, we're trying, to, we're trying to accommodate both groups, but we really, it's difficult. No, it's, I mean it's this. Almost, oh, the, that change. That shall. Shall, shall, yeah. As, yeah. But how about the 12 months? So... Well, just to, so should we have the town planner do a fourth article to address that? He would have to write that up. Yeah. Yeah, I would, well, I've, uh, I've dealt with that question already for the, the length of time. Where are my articles? Um, it would just be a change from the 90 days to the 365 days. Is there, do we have information about other towns that have it, what, what their time, what the limits are of the months? They vary. Um, I, I, is the predominant 12 months or is the predominant less? I don't know off the top of my head. I can evaluate that. I know that the predominant is to create year-round housing. Yeah. I have... Um, Do you know what I mean? Like, I know that. As a person who that. is building an AD right now, I, um, I would, at the end of the cost, I'm eager to rent it to anyone who will occupy it. If we can encourage more year-round rental housing, we should. That's the purpose of it. Um, I recognize that our workforce is varied and seasonal in capacity, but there are many year-round workers who are desperate for a 12-month lease. So you would say of the two groups, 
the more predominant group would be those looking for 12-month rentals? The need is great. Oh, I would say yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, I work in that industry. That's, that's um, the answer. Yeah, and I think that companies, um, like franchises, like they're, they're, they're somehow dealing with housing their J-1 uh, students. Um, whereas um, other employees, our year-round workforce, they don't have that. They don't have that support. Um, because to have a J-1 visa student come over, you have to ensure they have housing. Mm -hmm. And and some Money. company owners, like landscapers, they actually house them in their own home mm -hmm. for the summer. Um, so there's more resources there than for our year-round workforce. I'd like to give it a try and see if we get some, you know, we'll know if people are renting in, uh, 90 days because there'll be a violation. Huh. Somebody will, neighbors will call, you know what I mean? Um, you're in the business. If you're, if you're telling me, and I believe you, that it's more important for 12 months than three months, I'll say, okay. I do feel... I, I, I disagree personally with it, but I can't argue the facts if that's what you're saying. Yeah. So. I can say with a certain degree bad. of confidence that since we made this change, that there have been a number of accessory apartments permitted that are not being utilized for year-round units. They're sitting there empty. Um, so I think it's prudent to consider... A 12 months at least term. Um, I think we should go forward and get I, this done. I right? have no I have no personal qualms with greater flexibility in the timeline, but the the purpose and intent of the bylaw is what it is. And that is year round rental housing. So I'll leave that to the board to decide. Entertain a motion. Oh, I, I make a motion that we um, slightly modify um, the article. That says to see if the town will vote to amend section 174454 subsection one I. to our oh, I to strike the words 90 consecutive days and replace it with 12 consecutive months. Second. How do you vote? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay. Reluctant, reluctant okay. 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 <laughs> Not sure that's legal. Aye. I, I, it's a little bit more I, positive than present. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. And the next one, uh, this is. Oh, apologies. Apologies. Yes, Madam sir. Chair, she had a, the gentleman had an additional no, comment about Blue Castle Drive. Do you want to come up here? Yeah. Can we come back to this afterwards? Yeah, we'll, we'll take his comment and go back. Yeah, go just to. On, uh, it's, my name is John Cornack, 61 Blue Castle Drive. Um, this might be an engineering question. Um, I spoke to Evan today about mm -hmm. when you came out, you guys, I know you and Evan came out and saw our, my driveway issue right. I was complaining about. And you said maybe a berm, but the other night when it rained last night, I was watching the water and it puddles up in my driveway and then it finally trickles out to go down the road like it should. And if you put a berm, then my... I see what you're saying. My, I have the lowest lot on Blue Castle. Uh -huh. And, and the, I've the had water... The neighbor next door, the water... Everything from comes from the neighbor next yeah. door to my yard. And I've been asking Jack, since I bought the house, to address it. And he said next week, next week, and he's never done it. I've already spent $5,000 with pits and dra you know drainage in my own yard to have it go. So I know you did grading on the road and shot grades, how, what's the difference of the shoulder, you know, the way the water runs down, is it? Is it what I'm gonna suggest we do, just because I don't have the data in front right, of me right. and, and yeah. I'm not the engineer, but uh, the engineer's meeting on site tomorrow as I noted to you yes. on the phone. Yeah, and I Can know I, I cannot be oh, there, not but present. Is there you have my cell phone. I have your, let me take it again, just so I yep. have it, I'm gonna put it right in my phone tonight. Okay. Um, so I, once I know the time, um, I can give you a call. Okay. And we can evaluate this on the site. Yeah, that's great. With the engineer. Yeah, just something, because I'm just really nervous that once they pave it and it rains, it's all going to go down and go right in my driveway, and then, then I'm out because Jacques will do absolutely nothing. Yeah. He just, I went down today and cleaned off my lawn because I called him last night, said, you pushed all the grass on my lawn, and part of that picture was on my grass. And he said, oh, yeah, I'll take care of it tomorrow morning. I went down, there was no one there. I yeah. pulled the grass off and it was actually starting to burn. Uh -huh. It doesn't take long. So the poor people that haven't 
been able to clean it off today, it's not going to be good. No, it's very unfortunate. Yeah, but uh, right, promises yeah. the world. But thank you. Yes, yep. you bet. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, okay, now go to the big one. Um, I'm not. I, You're not done with no. the accessory apartment. Pardon me? The accessory apartment. Oh, the accessory apartment. Yep. No, you're not. You gave so also on that article, um, it talks about the accessory apartment shall not be used for boarding and lodging. And our, there's a comment from Arden that Thank neither you. unit should be. Sounds good. That neither unit should be used for boarding and lodging. And so presumably, I guess the purpose is if, um, if you can't Airbnb the ADU and you rent the ADU, but you're the principal occupant of the principal dwelling, you can't Airbnb that either. Right. Is that the yes. purpose and intent? Yeah, of she, she left. So, um, so that would have to change this article a little bit. I'll have to. I'll bring out an amendment back that if the board wants to go in that direction uh, to your next meeting, incorporating said recommendation. Okay. So, is everybody on board with that? That yeah. neither unit can be used for boarding or lodging. Simultaneously. Right? No, they can't be used for boarding or lodging, which is a different use than a year-round rent oh, okay. rental. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, what is the exact definition of boarding and lodging? It's, it, it's, it was intended to uh, identify that Airbnb is essentially a commercial use of a residential property, right? It's a, it's a hotel room. Okay. Um, so that was the purpose of inserting that language in the 2019 amendment. Um, okay, so there's that. Um, I did have a I did have a proposal to increase the minimum size from 300 square feet to 450 square feet. I think 300 square feet is just inhumane. That's a New York apartment. That's like worse than a New York apartment, right? Yeah. So, do you know if any of them have been small? I do not. That's small. Do you think you could? check that for our next meeting yeah i could look into that see if anything went below 450. sure because i'm i'm kind of like yeah that i've been in units motel units old motel units that have been switched out to um year-round housing and they're more like sros that you would see in some place <clears throat> that people are like institutional it, they're so small. It's well, like a, a one-car garage could be 20 by 20. Am I right okay. on that? Yeah. So that's 400 that's square 400 feet. Square feet. My, picture what a one-car garage looks like. Is that too small? My mother's ADU is 586 square feet. That's 600 square feet. About 600. That's comfortable. It, oh, it's, it feels quite large. Yeah. <laughs> I think she could get away with less. 450 is, <laughs> is good. Um, 450 square feet. I, don't, I think you're right about the size, but I mean, if we're really looking for housing. You're, are you eliminating uh, opportunity that might be affordable in a smaller place yeah. by doing that? that? Somebody all could of, build an ADU. I mean, Let's I guess what's the average small unit small size yeah. of a studio apartment? What's the average? 500 unit? square feet. 500 square feet? So, I mean, I guess that's the that's the question. I, mean, I could put my wife in a small place like that. <laughs> put her in a nanny pod. You're always making jokes your wife's expensive. Nanny we're nanny not on TV, man. are we? <laughs> so, but it could be you a trouble. But if you can see, what, what, are the small, what are the ones on the smaller side sure. Sure. that in Mashpee, yeah. maybe if we set it at 450, we might not have to worry about it. Now, other towns, right, they have 800 square foot ranches that people are putting in um, ADUs. So they really do need a smaller size because the housing stock is smaller than Mashpee. But Mashpee has a fairly large housing stock, um, you know, square foot wise. Well, let's just not eliminate possibilities, that's all. I, I will I, evaluate the data. Yeah, right. and, and, and we, we still have another meeting before we decide. Is that good? What objection would you have to a 300 square foot if somebody's you, looking out on you can't, the, living out on the street to have a 300 square so foot? There's some standard um, things you need for a kitchen. For example, you need a counter. Yeah. Okay. Um, you need like four feet of a counter for people to cook. Um, you need a separate bathroom with a door. True. Okay. Um, so I have seen things that have been proposed 
with like the toilet in the room with the bathroom. Like you need that space so that you can have separate sanitary areas. At P Town, they rent out their sheds. Yeah. I actually did three of them. Like Mary said, we had to put a bathroom in um. with a door. It, it, what it was was a shower, and the toilet was on the kind of like the shower. Uh -huh. It was all one unit in there, the thing. The little kitchen, you got to have a stove and a sink. We had a, it was a, a refrigerator. Refrigerator, but it was a 20, 24 inch stove, little sink, and a, a, a it's husband like, and wife lived in it. And how many square feet was it? It was 12 by 14, whatever that. Ugh. It was, and I, you can't cook. There's no there's no room to cook. <clears throat> I've been in uh, places where, and it's gas stoves, but the wall had flame marks on it. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, you, you need some space. So if our housing stock can tolerate an ADU of 450 square feet, we should do it for health and safety reasons. Yeah. Well, well, all right, now you're making a you're point, look health at, and safety yeah, okay. reasons. Yeah, and remember, an ADU requires a kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom, and a living facility. Yeah. The, th the minimum is 300 now. I bet you we don't even have any close to it. So we'll look at it and see what we get. Yeah. Can it be a studio? I think it can be a studio. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's what that. you've described is 268 square feet. And I called the cops. Couple, you called the uh, cops? People, because I was working in the morning, and I see people, people coming out of the, the shed. And I said, <laughs> I called the owner. I said, I think somebody's living in your shed, but I called the cops too because I thought they were robbing it. So, <laughs> oh, no. We, we rent that out. You know, it's stuff. And, and it's, it one, it's one thing for a weekend where you want to try something different or a train ride, <laughs> no, right? It's, but it's another thing to live no. in something like that in the winter. Yeah. You know, it's... Yeah. Well, it was mainly workforce. Yeah. They rented to the and it was in the season, the in the summer. Yeah, but... Now they stay all the way till November. Yeah. They used to leave when I first started down there, right after Labor Day. And every year they stay longer and longer. Mm -hmm. Now it's from April to November. So they're living in when it's cold. So but just house. when it really starts getting cold, they yeah. leave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, someone put a heat in there. Now, those oh, space those are dangerous too. That's there. Yeah. A, a woodshed. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we'll defer on that till next meeting. Yep. All right, we don't have to vote on that, right? No. 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 Okay, okay, just okay. defer. Just want to keep the the you know these moving through process. Okay. Um, I, next Here comes I, the good one: raise and replace. Raise and replace. So I um, there are a couple couple things I, I provided you. I, ha I had a question for council. I'm, I was struggling writing one particular provision here. We were discussing it at our last meeting, and it was. The Dennis bylaw contemplates essentially a, a gross floor area ratio as it pertains to increases for lot coverage if you have a lot coverage nonconformity. And I don't want to, I don't believe it is going to be beneficial for us to recycle that language for Mashby for the following reason. Um, there hasn't been a single raised replace that I'm aware of that has had a, uh, a lot coverage nonconformity of actual structures on the ground. There have been, since the 228 waiting place decision, I'll say artificial uh, lot coverage nonconformities because of the land subject coastal storm flow issue. Mm -hmm. So presumably, if you're in the floodplain and you, wanna, and you are, say, 15% lot coverage of actual structures in the lot, you could go up to 25. And, you, and the lot coverage of actual structures in the lot does not, is not a nonconformity, but you're made nonconforming by the land subject to coastal storm flow, which presumably would allow you to extend your lot coverage beyond the minimum, which the Board of Appeals doesn't do, but I want to provide the distinction between these issues in this bylaw, whereas there's a, a clear delineation or understanding of how, of, of actual lot coverage, I'm going to call it, and lot coverage as it pertains to land subject to coastal storm flow. I, would have, I was struggling to write the particular provision that recognized this, so I asked council to help. So I've sent this draft, as you currently see it, to council with that particular question. He was not able to respond by this meeting. Um, so the only other thing I wanted to clarify, and we've discussed at our last meeting, was the extension of a setback nonconformity. And we were discussing um, what the one provision in here means. Um, 
actions requiring a finding of substantially more detrimental. So I, I, I've clarified this, and I think it's quite understandable. Um, for example. Uh, Which one do you want? Uh, this would be uh, the third, fourth subsection, actions requiring a finding of substantially more detrimental number two. Okay. So if you uh, are in a zoning district that has a 15-foot minimum setback, mm -hmm. and you currently, your existing condition is 10 feet from the side, so you have thus five feet, you have a five-foot nonconformity into that side setback, right. and your house is 20 feet in depth. That's 100 square feet of non-conforming floor space. Under this proposal, any raise and replace that proposes an increase in that floor area of 40% or 40, 40 square feet in that same setback area would be found to be substantially more detrimental and would not be able to be approved. So that puts a, a strong... Uh, defines a strong parameter around increasing the size setback nonconformities. So if you wanted to grow, you'd grow modestly, very modestly, and it would certainly impact a second floor because the second floor would further be impacted by the same limitation. Oh, sure. So for a 100 square foot nonconformity, you can grow 40 square feet in that side setback, and that's it. For me, the outstanding issue is the lot coverage issue, and I really want council's input on it. That's important to have the lot coverage. I just couldn't get the language right. I, tr I, I tried, and ultimately I needed a... You know, Evan, this is very confusing. Do you think you could write this so that, um, you know, you ask a question, like an example, an illustration? Yeah. St a statement of... I did, the, a, of, I did a... Of the bylaw and an illustration, hypothetical. Like an example for yeah. each one? I think I printed either. I have a, I have a for example in my current draft, and it's not in there. There is there is a for example, but it's only for one of your points. Um, so one, see, I'm I'm having trouble understanding what this is saying. So I'm having trouble having any type of discussion about it. So for me, for example, I don't want any existing nonconformity to be increased. Does that say that in here? No. 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 But see, I can't even understand this language, so it's hard to even discuss that. It is the most complicated thing we've ever Why wouldn't we ask a builder that complicated, but I don't, know, I don't know how to clarify it for you. I mean, I ultimately... Think, I think we need a chart of all the things that we want this bylaw to say. And, you know, like, I, I don't want... I don't want further encroachment into a side setback. There, that's not possible under this. Okay, but I can't, I don't, I don't even know how to say, I don't even know which one says that. I mean, so that's it, so, um, gosh. Is there somebody in town as a builder that would come and use, use a, a It says plan? number four. No, can, to, I mean, the town planner can do it. He knows I'll, which I'll one. Know, so in the same bottom paragraph, number four, the increase in the intensity of a setback nonconformity by further encroaching into a setback area that currently exists requires a finding of substantial detriment and would not be permitted. So why, instead of saying actions requiring, why can't we just say not permitted? You can say that. That, I'm, the, I, I see what you're saying. This, no, this bill. Not permitted, permitted. You can say that. So number four, I think it should say the increase in intensity of set, setback, nonconformity by further encroachment into a setback area that currently exists is not permitted. Fine. But it can't have that title, actions requiring a finding of substantial <clears throat> I, can, I can work on that. We, we, we utilize the Dennis bylaw as a skeleton, so I didn't mess with their titles. No. All right, so that one, okay. So, right, this, so what does number five do? So in number, number five is saying if you're going to re reconstruct in the Papanesset Overlay District, um, you can't reintroduce impervious services. Yeah. So if you're proposing an asphalt driveway, you can't do it. It would be substantially more detrimental and be subject to a denial. No, yeah, that's clear. So you could also also say, well, I just, you know, because if someone has a pre-existing impervious surface, you don't want them to retain it. You don't want to what? You don't want to retain it. So it's just, I was going to say they're not permitted. 
So the, you're saying you don't want a grandfather impervious services. No. There's no grandfather of impervious. And you don't want to introduce any new. Well, if you, if you eliminate your structure, you've now lost, you're, you've essentially, the special abandoned. permit, you've abandoned your house. Okay. So okay. if you're going to, if you want to preserve your right to rebuild it in the Papanesset overlay, you're going to eliminate okay. impervious services. So nobody that raise and replaces can have an asphalt driveway. If you approve this provision. That's only a proper NASA though, right? Correct. Yeah. Where the real, you know, the drainage and the groundwater <coughs> issues are substantial. Can, can we go back to uh, actions requiring item two? Yeah. Uh, you talk about total area of finished living space. I, I think uh, there, there's a definition of, you know, what's finished, what's not finished. If I put a structure up, a roof on it, walls on it, windows on it, floor on it. I could live there. It's building code defined, living sp the finished living space. So like, like this is providing a differentiation between like mechanical space where your hot water tank and your furnaces and stuff like that and habitable space. So is there, is there a question, Rob? Yeah, so I mean, I could see a shed being uninsulated, summer use only, and uh, but if that shed was increased or whatever on a, uh, let's say, uh, a setback or a non-conforming uh, frontage or side, and they increased it, but they didn't finish it, but people still live there. That, well, didn't finish that, it. They didn't well, get it. Well, this doesn't have anything to do with people occupying the space, really. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's defining what constitutes Finish. Okay, yeah. finish. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, a wall, uh, ceiling, floors, uh, to me, that's an unfinished space. But I know pe I, I could certainly live in it. Well, what this is saying is any time. floor space in the non conforming area, including sheds, including edge of your living room, including basement, that's all covered by this section. So in, you can't, if, you're, if you have a basement in your side setback area, it's not exempted from the increase restriction because it's unfinished is what this is saying. I can further ask council to clarify this language as well. See, like number one is perfectly oh. clear. Go ahead. Wait. Yeah, let's, it, how, okay. So cover, mm -hmm. why only uncovered porches and decks? Why not covered porches and decks? Why not? Yeah. So um, I think it should be uncovered and covered. I mean, if we're going to do uncovered, we should do covered. I don't know where you are, Mary. At two. I'm still on two. Okay. Increase. So did, did he answer your question? Well, yeah, I, I'm vague as to what, fin you know, the, ha the the housing codes or the uh, uh, un unfinished versus unfinished and, and habitable and not habitable. But and then I think we should introduce uncovered, you know, not just leave it at uncovered porches and decks, but covered porches. But if you and have decks. a covered porch, now that's that might not isn't be that part of your house. That might no. not be considered livable space. No, I don't think so. And and we're gonna we're gonna try to be as clear as possible. If it is considered livable space and it's in there, it's just redundant. If it's if it's not in there, it's gonna cause confusion for the building commissioner on how to enforce it. I think it would really help, like I mean, like number one, I could do the drawing for that. You've got 40, 40 feet in the front, 15, 15, and 15 on the sides and back. And if you draw, it, it, you have a conforming structure and you try to move that house over to the 10 foot line, then you've, you've violated, you've substantially made it more detrimental, right? I'm sorry, I say mean, that again. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's covered in four, not one. I'm looking at one, the creation of any new nonconformity where no nonconformity currently exists. There's no nonconformity there. The setbacks are 15, 15, 15, and 40. But the guy builds a house and he builds it 10 feet on the sideline, from the sideline. 
He's created a nonconformity. Yeah, you can't. It just, the current language today doesn't allow you to create any new nonconformity. So right. Even if you have one nonconformity, you can't create a second one. Right. What are, what are examples of nonconformity? You have the setback. Side setback, lot coverage, building height. Right. Okay, so do so, you have something in here about building height? We don't. I don't, I mean, the que this question is, I don't know if there are any non-conforming building heights in Mashpee, but we could. No. Um, I, would, I would similarly suggest that, you know. Well, it, isn't it different in Pompanasset than it is? It's, it's 30 feet, not 35 30, feet. 30 feet? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. At the peak. From ground. So it's 30, yeah. So it's, so you think it's majorly three. Lock coverage. Setbacks and height. Yes. Is there anything else it could be? I mean, we're really dealing with nonconformities, dimensional nonconformities, which are defined in the okay. land space requirements table. So, okay. I, uh, I mean, we're not talking about lot area here, obviously. So, yeah, I think okay. lot coverage, right. setbacks, and height gets at it. So, how do we want to deal with height? Do we want to just cap it at the any nonconforming height cannot be increased? Yeah. Yeah. And it's happened so many okay. times yeah. in Pompanesset. Well, I mean, so what, what well, Mary's we, saying is, you know, so in Pompanesset, right, it's a 30-foot height maximum. What do we do if someone's existing house is 31 feet? How, far, how much do we allow them, if at all, to extend that conformity? We're suggesting that you can't extend it all just like you can't extend a side setback yeah, conformity. That makes but sense. I would suggest you deal with it exactly as you deal with um, the setback nonconformity where it says the increase in the intensity of a setback nonconformity by further encroaching into a setback area that currently exists is, is uh, <coughs> not permitted. I would say the increase in the intensity of a height nonconformity by further increasing the height of the existing building is not permitted. Something like that. Yep. Okay. Right. So... More work to be done. And lot coverage too. Right. And so I didn't what, anticipate what we resolving this yeah, today. So what, what, what do you have in here about lot coverage? Which one do I address? So when you add lot coverage with that, Evan? The my. Can I see what draft you? I share with you. I think. Um, no, you it's on the second page. To that. Yeah. The increase in the intensity of set, height page. setback lot coverage. Um, Nonconformity by further encroaching. I don't know. That, no. So, by I'm proposing to. I don't know. Uh, so this is the provision I was struggling with, and I've sent a question to town council on it. And what did what did, what do you so, want it to say? So, like in theory. What I want. So again, uh, today, if you are in a home, and your existing condition is that you have. 80% lot coverage by structures and you're allowed 20% lot coverage, you can go up to that 20% as everyone else can and you can't exceed that 20%. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are no, there have been no major issues of lot coverage nonconformities in the town of Mashpee and the Board of Appeals to date has not allowed anyone to exceed the minimum lot coverage. I wanna memorialize that in the bylaw in writing, but further, there's an issue that was exposed by the 228 waiting place decision as it pertains to lot coverage. Whereas uh, anything, any wetland as defined in the Wetlands Protection Act has to be eliminated from the denominator of a lot coverage calculation. So if you're 100% land subject to coastal storm flow, you have a denominator of zero. So your existing condition is a lot coverage of 100%. So you thus have an artificial lot coverage nonconformity that you may presumably continue, extend, or alter. So one could presumably exceed the actual lot coverage of the 20%. Um, I want to provide that distinction in writing that, so it allows someone to go up to the maximum lot coverage but doesn't allow them to artificially increase lot coverage beyond the minimum because of that technicality. It is complicated, which is why I've asked council's assistance on this one. But ultimately, what I want to allow people to do is extend, or um, uh, I want to essentially rectify or eliminate the potential, the non-conform, the artificial non-conformity created with the land subject to coastal storm flow issue. So someone couldn't argue they could extend beyond the 20 or 25 percent lot coverage mm -hmm. solely because they're in the floodplain. So that's all right. Mm. Yes, I agree. Yeah. 
So I've, that's that's what I've asked counsel to help that's with. A lot of thinking, huh? Yes. Well, and, and write it, trying to write it was a near impossibility. I needed I needed legal assistance with it. So and that's going to be a really good one to have an an example. Yeah. A mathematical example, yeah. mm-hmm. so that the building commissioner, you know, doesn't have to sit there and try to figure out what we were saying. So, so I wanted to do a couple of things. I was hoping to have counsel's opinion today to present to you. I did not have it, but I'd like to get his <coughs> opinion so I can shore up this draft, get some of the, you know, made charts or graphs or whatever. But ultimately, um, I'd like to have a joint meeting with the Zoning Board of Appeals to review this bylaw. I would love for this to be a joint submission with them to the town meeting for approval. Can I ask you uh, to go back to the lot coverage? Sure. You're, you're finding that most people don't have a nonconformity because of the you lot coverage. You don't exceed 20%. Correct. And it's been a, an unwritten policy, if you will, of the Board of Appeals to not allow them to exceed lot coverage. The setback nonconformity is an increase in height. Has been a little, there's been a more variability and flexibility in that regard. So this would provide some sort of a you know, solid parameter around those issues. Um, but the language relative to lot coverage and land subject to coastal storm flow needs to be addressed in this amendment. You know, honestly, the way I, the way I see comprehending this really for everybody is an example under each action requiring a finding of substantially more detrimental. I provided one for the lot coverage. You don't have one for the, or excuse me, for the setback. You don't have one for the lot coverage because I don't have the language yet. Okay. But I agree. So what does the findings by Zoning Board of Appeals that may not be substantially more detrimental, so, what, what do those mean? Those so what three. it's saying is, um, where's my freaking copy? Look at me. May I? Like, let's take a look at number two. Well, two. Well, it's just, can we just go right down the line because yeah, okay. I'm confused by all three. Yep. So this is saying if you are, you have a pre-existing non-conforming structure, you can increase the footprint of that structure. It can, can it, say it again? Say it, it again. If you are what? The, the fo- if you have a pre-existing non-conforming structure, fi- it may not be, you may consider increasing the footprint it, within certain parameters, which are defined below. Right, so like, um, if you have a side setback nonconformity, but you have more room on the right side, your footprint can get bigger within those parameters. You can't create a new nonconformity, but you're allowed to make your house bigger. That's what it's saying. I got that. You're allowed to increase the Up lot to twenty percent co- of the coverage. lot coverage. As long as you don't exceed but twenty. But it's almost like all right. So if your if your nonconformity is a setback, you can grow your house in the other direction. Right. Okay. Right. And so two is uh, something we need to discuss. It allow, this is saying you can potentially increase the lot coverage of a structure where the structure currently exceeds lot coverage. We don't want to do that. What does that mean? But what do you mean? You can't. What does that mean? Can we increase give the, us some more examples yeah, on give two. It, give, us, give us a hypothetical. Okay. Um, Minimum setback requirement or lot coverage requirement or maximum lot coverage requirement in Papanasset Overlay District is 25% by structures. Lot coverage by structures is 25%. Okay. This is saying, um, this is, this is, language needs, we need to deal with this in MASH because I don't think we want to do this. Okay. Um, if you have a nonconformity of lot coverage, such as it's 26%, you can potentially increase that. I don't think the Board of Appeals wants to do that. I don't think the Planning Board wants to do that. But the one thing that we would need to consider and why it's still in here is because of the land subject to coastal storm flow issue. Because technically, in the floodplain, there are numerous lot coverage nonconformities. And you want to presumably allow someone to increase that nonconformity within the actual lot coverage maximum, which is 20 or 25 percent. So number two has to get rewritten with town council. Well, I think as long as the provision in uh, oh, number God. three is oh, adequate. No. Um, you may want to allow that to stay in there because the lot coverage nonconformity will actually remain if we don't change the definition of lot coverage to include land coverage, coastal storm flow. I think somebody's trying to get in. <laughs> I hope it's a friend. Fireworks. It's fireworks? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it sounded like someone hit the glass. Is someone shooting Roman candles over here or something? I don't know. <laughs> well, Chrissy's like, what the heck? <laughs> all right, all right. So now I've completely lost my train of thought. For so um, I th- say it again. 
So right. the reason that two is in there now and needs to stay in there unless we, if this wouldn't be pertinent if we were to change the definition of lot coverage to exclude land subject to coastal storm flow. I'm not sure that's what we wanna do because you presumably want to allow someone to increase the lot coverage of a structure where the structure currently exceeds lot coverage because that denominator issue as a result of the land subject to coastal storm flow where the denominator is zero and thus you have 100% lot coverage. You're gonna to wanna to allow someone to potentially increase the size, you want, if they want to increase the size of their house. Let's do an exact example. Let's please. You kill me, man. <laughs> so I think this needs town council. It's already submitted. Okay, this, this needs to get rewritten by town council. If there's no land subject to floodwaters, water flow or whatever, coastal flood does exact, not apply. That's exactly what I've asked them to address because there needs to be a distinction made. Yeah, right. There has to be a clear distinction between these issues made because if you're someone in Papanesset, these issues impact you way differently than someone on Main Street who's not in a floodplain. <clears throat> um, and if that distinction is not made and they're dealt with in the same fashion, there's a certain inequity there. That's right. So okay. um, that's what I've asked them to Let's address. Let's table this till you, it gets with town council. We don't have to make a motion, correct? No. No, we're, we're, all right, we've done two. What about three? We did one and two. Can, can he... Do you have the patience to cover number three? Yeah, sure. So go ahead. Um, so um, this is saying you you, okay. you could presumably or allow the increase in height of your structure, even in the area that is non-conforming, like above a non-conforming setback, but you can't exceed again that for, that floor space of more okay. than forty percent. So that's saying your your height could presumably get bigger, but within certain parameters. So this one, two, and three that's under. Findings by the ZBA may not be substantially more detrimental. That one, two, and three, those are things that could be allowed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's saying you can do these things, and the next is how far you can go. Oh, the next section, actions requiring a finding? Exactly. So Are, so are like, not necessarily prohibited. Right. So you can increase the footprint of your structure so long as you don't create a new nonconformity or increase a side setback nonconformity. Right. Make your own adventure novel. That's what I always call it. I, uh, yeah, we need an illustrated. <laughs> we, we need a graphic honestly, novel. Honestly, yeah, you know, hypotheticals are great. I mean, that's what we so, used to do in, in law school for cases, and it really, you get it when you see a hypothetical. Who can we get to draw this stuff up? I've reached out to a couple architect friends to do something in SketchUp. You don't think Ed can do it? He doesn't have Well, it. Ed might work at CAD, which is two-dimensional. We can, eat. I mean, I could do this in two dimensions. It's not that complicated. But in three dimensions, <coughs> if you want to see it in three dimensions, it needs to be in a different program. Do we need it in three dimensions? I don't think dimensions? we need three dimensionals. If you get the hypo and Ed you just. can do three dimensional. <coughs> Rob's right in there, the engineer. I don't have Ken. <laughs> well, how, whatever we do, it would be a good idea to get some good examples of each one so therefore it's clear. <coughs> it isn't now, it leads a lot to speculation. It's just not worth it. And the only thing I would just I'm say is that, that. The, the, uh, the chair of the Board of Appeals and the Board of Appeals is very interested in working with the planning board on this, and I'd like to encourage that. If, if well, I'm sure they are. <laughs> well, we, we shall leave that to our Madam Chair. Okay, well. I think, I, they, should, I think they should be involved because they're going to, uh, you know, work together and get it all done right. Yeah. Could you, could you in the next couple of weeks, put together these hypotheticals, yes. situations that fit? Okay, like for example, um, wait do a we have to have a special meeting with the ZBA at a separate time? It might be prudent to consider one. Okay, <clears throat> come on down, and we'll take a ride through Papadopsis, and we'll find examples everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, and there. You know, that's probably what I should just do: is take actual cases and see that's how this bylaw yeah. would apply. Yeah, I think so. That's what I'm, I'm sure going we, to do. I'm sure we can find them pretty simply. What I asked for in 2018. Thank you. <laughs> Not from you, somebody else. <laughs> okay, so we are moving on now? Moving yep. on now. All right. Trees now. Thank you, uh, Evan. That was thank good. Thank you. It's, it's really a lot of mental work here. Really challenging. I'm confused in that, that, that last one. Yeah. Um, okay, the next one is my tree bylaw. Our tree bylaw, I should say. Hold on one second. Oh, I didn't print new copies for everybody. Did you want me to print new copies for everybody? 
No, I didn't. Uh, is there, go ahead. Talk, oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. I'm just going to pass this out. This is, it gets stupid toward the end because this, I'm just trying to show you and illustrate to you how hard it is to do what you asked us to do last time. Give us, a, give us some exemptions or some help about homeowners. Should homeowners have the same requirements as, say, somebody who is engaged in a building activity, right? A guy who's not doing anything it? but just cutting down a few trees is, that is really what would be the tree yard. Yeah. Remember, you can cut down mm -hmm. anything you want outside the tree yard, the setbacks. Right. In a home, 40, 15, 15, and the back is 15. So what, what rules would apply to homeowners? So just take a look at this. Can I provide a little additional distinction? Do you mind? Uh, pardon me? Can I add a little something? Sure, please. So when Karen and I were discussing this, um, as we have initially presented the draft to you, that covers... It covers property owners, whether they be commercial, industrial, or residential. Um, uh, it, 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 if, they're a if they're seeking to do work in, a, in connection with a building activity, i.e. a building permit or some other building activity as defined in the bylaw, um, then they trigger review and approval of a tree protection plan if, if necessary. But if, so my question to Karen was, what if I'm a property owner who is not seeking a building permit, who has no interest in a building activity in a 12-month period of time, and I have a 20-inch at diameter breast height white oak in my, tr in my tree yard. In your tree yard. What would be the tree yard? In the Do setback. I just get to remove it because I'm not doing a building activity? So the, there's an equity question there is, some property owners will have no restrictions in removing trees because they're not seeking a building permit. And we wondered, is that something we want to allow or create some sort of exemption for or expedited review process? Because presumably, that's, it seems a little unfair in a, in a sense. Um, where it, so I, that's, that's something we wanted to raise and elevate to the board as a discussion point. It's like, do we, do we want to try and carve something out, or just try and make it work as we've proposed it. Whereas, you know, you're doing a raise and replace, or a, an addition. Do we have to have a, should you have a reason why you want to get that tree out in your yard? Or? You can, if you look at this, you just let, let me go through this with him, because I really don't know what I'm thinking on this. Okay, homeowner, he's not engaged in a building activity, which is defined <coughs> in definitions under two. I uh, mentioned the work performed pursuant to a special permit, work performed pursuant to site plan approval, construction of a new dwelling, raising an existing dwelling, construction of a subdivision, clearing, grading, or site work preparation performed within 12 months prior to undertaking of any of the above. So he, all he's doing is this tree is crowding out some uh, holly tree, and he wants to take down this 20-foot healthy tree that if he were under a tree permit, would he's be regulated. in the yard. He's right. in the tree yard. Now, that could get really expensive if we charge him. Yeah, what, what do we do in that do scenario? Do? Yeah. Remember, he can take any tree he wants out uh, in outside the tree yard that's like a, a tree that's close to his house about right. to hit it. So I said here, this is as far as I could get. He can take out, if he's not engaged in a building activity, he can remove the following trees by right. A healthy tree with a diameter of breast height of six, six inches or greater. He can remove all these trees, but he has limitations on just what he can do. He could take any dead tree out he wants with, with no, nothing. Infested tree, just cut it down. Invasive tree, cut it down. Or any tree that could be an immediate danger to public health. Right. In the tree yard or any tree outside the tree yard. Yeah. But what does he have to do if he takes down a healthy tree? A healthy tree. Does he have to pay? And how does the town 
enforce it. Like with the with the building activity, you have a, the, the you have act. you can't right. get a building permit unless you have a tree preservation bio, uh, permit. So there's the enforcement. But so it's no like unless you have a building permit. Uh, you can't get a building permit. But, but what I'm the, the the challenge we're we're dealing with is if you're not seeking a building permit, so you can still cut down every tree. Yeah. So I was thinking about this, right? So um, I think it's a good place to start because trees, taking down trees are expensive, mm -hmm. right? Very. <coughs> so, but when you're building a house, right? It's a very small line item yeah. <laughs> compared to other stuff, right? So I'm like, when people are spending money on these, these properties, we're preserving the trees when money is being spent, yeah. right? In out years, people people will already have that mortgage set. You know that construction financing is done. They they like I was thinking that nah, people will leave the trees alone once the house is built. It's it's during construction that you see people just go in and clear everything, and that's kind of what we want to stop yeah, happening. Yeah, definitely. So if so, I think it's a good place to start, and if it's if people love it and say, we want all trees protected, then we can go from there. But right now, I think, and because it has that mechanism of a construction activity, that, you know, that, that way of capturing it, um, then I, I think this is the only, this is the, the only functional way to start. There's, there's new that's, state. That's where we've come That's around. kind of where we ended, too. There's new yeah. state laws coming out about really? trees. Really? I, yeah. I don't know if you heard that, the governor... She's trying to push to save trees because it's you know, green that it, it helps. Well, they're important there. for the for they're, climate. They're coming out with a lot of new new laws, so that may help us here too. With the we'll start looking that up, we'll research that right away. Another thing I I would like to see, if somebody cuts down a tree, they can bring it to the the you know the transfer station, and the residents of the town. Can salvage it. Salvage it, you know. They take the trees and they grind them all up. But I wish we could have maybe have some, like even some of the tribe members, if they have a truck, they tell, them, hey, I cut two trees down. If you want to come and, you know, chop them up for the size, put them in the truck, and get them out of here. I don't, I don't know if it can be a law, but we should advertise that, like if you cut the trees down. Okay, what, and what is the purpose for firewood? Firewood, yeah, a lot of tribes. But you can't do pines. If you burn the, the fire hot enough, you can do pine. Not, not all the time. But you gotta put a little diesel fuel on it. <laughs> no, but yeah. you can, if it burns hot enough. It we did, we, I went with Rob Mill, we went, we went to the tribe and offered all the trees in the seabury. And the guy called, called me back. I forget the guy's name now. They're going to take some of them. Oh, good. Oh. Yeah, we are, we are quite a few just waiting for them to come get them. Yeah, I maybe mean, that's a good <laughs> idea, you know. Yeah. So I like this bylaw. Well, it's working in very nice communities, <coughs> the concept overall, and we tried to make it uh, much less costly than some other places. Yeah. It, it works where you're We're not trying to it. hurt the builder. We're just trying to... Preserve, you know, one one said to me, well, that means if, you know, if I want to do a driveway, can I cut through? Well, I think we've got some provision in there. I hope we do. We have to look at it we once again. We asked everybody to we call did, yeah, so tree. I didn't provide, yeah. like, we, we did We permit not those that come up, don't do it, but we permit every tree. Yeah. We, if you call me and you say, I want to take a tree down, I go, you see. I, mean, I say you mark oh. it, I go look at it, yeah. and we decide whether or not it's the right thing to do. Yeah. On every home. That's receiver. a homeowner, but you wouldn't be doing that for a developer. Oh, and a developer, we have, they have to mark every tree that they're going to take down right. before we approve the project. That's what we did. You don't, you don't require replacement or... Sometimes they do. We do. We, do. Require, we require not to the extent of this, Yeah. because many times a tree is taken down where a house is going to be. But we do yeah. require mediation uh, and landscaping plan well, following that. Where a house is going to be, it's not going to be in the tree yard. Correct. Well, yeah, so what happens with the driveway going through the tree yard? We do every tree, not so just tree yard. I, we contemplated an exemption for the driveway, but what I had said to you was, well, we, we don't want someone to design their house <clears throat> you know, in a manner that... They have to twist around and 
like a pretzel to get the driveway. I, I question whether or not the exemption is important for a driveway just because someone could design their driveway sensitively around protected trees. Uh, depending on septic and uh, rest of the stuff, right? And so, like, I think I, I question whether or not we wanted to encourage that. Uh, it's, a, it's a policy decision, I think, for the board to make, but there's not currently an exemption for driveways, but we could create an exemption for driveways. But keep in mind, think about it this way. There are many configurations of a driveway. They're not all perpendicular straight shots in from a street. They are half moons or crescent driveways that take the totality of the tree yard. So if you were to exempt it, <clears throat> they're cutting down every tree in the front yard. Exactly. So well, I, I, I don't believe doing. it achieves, if in certain driveway configurations, you would achieve the purpose and intent of the preservation bylaw if you exempted the driveway because there's a large potential that the uh, the detriment to the, f the, f the front tree yard right. could be substantial. Yes, it could. If there so, were absolutely so pe so no way. Under this bylaw, they can remove the trees. They just need to mitigate appropriately. Yeah. So I, I don't think if, for that reason, I would recommend the driveway exemption. <coughs> well, well, what, it, I mean, could we think of a situation where the configuration of the, the frontage of the, of the, the lot was such with trees that you had to give them some kind of variance or carve out, that there was no other way to put that driveway in but right through this based on the configuration of the lot. And they'd have to mitigate for it. Yeah, I think part we, of the should, building we activity. should see if this works. Yeah. I mean, I, I just feel like it'd be too easy. Or, or you'd have more, you'd have the potential for more impact to that front tree yard than you might want given certain driveway configurations. And the, the you know, the, within that front, front tree yard, there's not, there may or may not be numerous protected trees. There may or may not be. Right. Um, so. They may be all, and they. I don't think you carve out the exception outside for the, the driveway yard. in my opinion. Okay, so do we want to send this over to the planning board or to the uh, select board isn't there some uh, uh, some spots, some blanks in here? It's really it's it's identifying who does what. <coughs> okay. Um, send it over for I think uh, consideration. I, should, and I think I should send it to the town manager and discuss within the mechanics of the bylaw so we can get an understanding of who's doing what. We've had preliminary discussions in this. Regard. He's got this. Yeah. So um, let's fill in the blanks by. Can we do that in two weeks? Yeah. Let's fill in the blanks in two weeks and then vote on it formally. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we know. What so we're we're happy with the bylaw, except we need the blanks. Who the who the yeah. uh, enforcement, enforcement agent is? Who the authorized agent is? Yep. And let this homeowners thing go because you see now how hard it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty tricky. I, I thought we could do it, and, yeah. I, and there's no way to be equitable about this. No. You're gonna hurt somebody, no matter what you do, though. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. One more thing. To, uh, uh, yeah. Let's see. The floodplain overlay. The floodplain. Oh. That remains unchanged. You've seen this draft three times now. Yeah. I make a motion that we submit it to the board of selectmen. Yes. For inclusion on uh, the town warrant. Floodplain. Second. Vote. Aye. 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 Okay, done. And is that it? We Oh, we didn't cover the last little bit of um, meetings. Uh, let's see, we did. I got did. my report, too. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You have the hazard mitigation workshop you're going to talk about and right on the top of the second page. Yep, I just had this workshop. It was at 430 today. It was virtual. Um, I was disappointed in attendance because I had multiple confirmations of people to attend and they did not come. Um, but with that being said, the survey that we released to support the hazard mitigation plan is still live and is essentially uh, ca is capturing exactly the data that you would have submitted if you had participated today. So I'm going to leave that survey open and continue to advertise it for another couple of weeks. Okay. okay. Um, I, I attended. It was excellent. Oh, cool. The consultant is excellent. What is his uh, pedigree? It was, a, it was a woman, right? Yeah, Jamie Kaplan. Her Jamie name Kaplan. And it was accomplished in like 37 and a half minutes. It was like 
it, it, it flew by. And it was that really, interesting. It, it, it was really, but, but also the presentation and the way that it just flowed just really. You got us started. If, yeah. So, you know, like sometimes you're like, oh, another public hearing. Oh. No, this was like interactive and informative. We did polls. Can we right see online. a video of this? Yes, the recording I'm going to be submitting to Mashpee TV uh, to go on the YouTube channel, and I'll create a engagement page okay, just like I do great. for the other items for. Uh, this process will but will start populating. So things. this was like a thirty-five minute thing. It was like a forty-five, 45 minutes yeah. or so. And it and it's all about climate change. This is all yeah. about yeah. climate change. And we're looking up at the sky I mean, and hazard mitigation planning is all about how we prepare and protect the town from droughts, fires, floods, storm surges, high winds. Um, a lot yeah. of people said put utilities underground. How many of us have you know? It's a blizzard and we lose power. And we're like, damn it, the utilities are not underground yet. It, it, you know, what do we? What facilities do we protect? A lot of people said schools. You know, it, it, it it's important that we that we all participated. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is, as I have asked the town to identify what are the high hazard areas and propose what mitigative actions we should be considering for those areas. Right. Like um, so the survey does the, the same thing. Yeah, the, you guys live in the, the, the southern part by the water. It, I found it difficult. I put Redbrook Road down, okay? But you got, they're asking for specific intersections. I don't live in an area like that. It's really important that you guys get it, the word out to your neighbors about places that flood. Yeah. Um, I did send it to your president of your homeowner association okay. the survey, so hopefully they distribute it. Yeah. Um, you guys must have distributed it. We have, but yeah. I mean, and there's, we're actually in pretty good shape. I know what you mean, yeah. There are yeah. some areas. So I'm going to keep that open um, for longer than I anticipated just because I was hoping for greater participation today. Yeah, Papa um, has got some serious problems over there. No oh, doubt. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I was, I, I'm happy you attended, Mary. I'm happy you liked it. Um, there'll be another workshop next month. Um, and the Hazard Mitigation Planning Committee is meeting tomorrow to go to dive in deeper. These are public meetings and are available for anyone to uh, come into the Wakoid room and follow in the morning. Tomorrow? Tomorrow morning, 9.30, I believe. Harbor Management and Planning and, Committee. And, and I just want to say, Dale, somebody from, is somebody from the tribe on that? So uh, we've reached out to Nelson, uh, oh, who's okay. indicated that he's likely to participate as a Nelson, committee okay, member. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I know way the Harbor Management that. Planning Committee is hosting their, uh, an, another public workshop at the clubhouse. I believe it is on June 13th. Specifically, I think generally for New Seabury uh, associations, um, considering they're, they're frequent users of the waterways and things like that, but it is a public workshop open and accessible to um, anyone interested in learning a little bit more and participating in the Harbor Management Planning uh, efforts. And then, uh, any questions on that? I don't have a lot of details other than I want to share the date with you. Alice. I think you said June, I think it's July. Thank you. Are you certain? I'm not certain. It's all capacity today, I'm pretty sure. Excuse me, July 13th, I'll check that. July 13th, I'll send you details via email. Um, next is housing production plan. I had my kickoff <laughs> meeting with our consultants. Uh, last week, we we're going to be meeting with the Affordable Housing Committee for a formal kind of kickoff with them in early uh, July. I think their, f their regularly scheduled meeting date, the Affordable Housing Committee, is it may be on July 4th, so it's obviously not going to be on that date. Uh, I need to follow up with Chair Isbitz to determine when we can have that uh, kickoff. But um, the other thing that our consultants wanted me to discuss with you and with the select board, I think, through the town manager as well, is um, we have a relatively quick, we, we want to get this situated in relatively, with relative efficiency for the sole purpose of we need to have the draft submitted to DHCD by December 31st, 2023, to get the money from the Cape Cod Commission that we were granted, the $25,000 we were granted. So we wanted to schedule now a joint meeting for the planning board and select board to submit this to DHCD. So I'm gonna relay that to um, the chair of the select board through the town manager's office. When but, do you wanna have it, like what month? In early December, probably. Um, 
And so, uh, Karen, if I could coordinate that with you uh, and with Rodney and thus, mm -hmm. and then obviously the chair of the select board, that would be beneficial for the process. Is it okay? I, I suggest that it's done at a, a, a board of selectmen meeting time. Yeah, sure. What do you guys think? Yeah. Um, okay, I wanted to say something on chairman's report going back. Um, it's about this SRF funding. You know, I, I kind of looked it up to, you know, it's so many uh, twists and turns. This is, you know, it is, it is complicated, but I guess people who do this every day understand it. Yesterday at the select board meeting, uh, Sue Dangle showed a film, a, 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 no sound, showed somebody go, traveling in a canoe in a Unmashby River put her hand in it and pulled out the most hideous gunk you could ever imagine. I mean, it looked like a witch's head of hair or something. It was just, <laughs> oh, it was, it was, it, it was a huge mat of algae, right? Yeah, it was green perfect. algae, <laughs> really. Yeah, I mean, it was horrible looking. Did it laugh at you? Well, it was just, <laughs> it was terrible. It almost hit me in the face on television. And then, then she showed a drone. She paid for a drone, I guess, out of her own money to run it over the Mashpee River towards Shoestring Bay. And it was terrible with the green algae. I mean, like, scary, terrible, disgusting. So Michaela was uh, talking about, you know, we have a deadline, August 1, August 11, 2023, to file this thing called the Project Evaluation Forms. I guess this is with the um, DEP, PEF, which means if you don't meet that deadline, you lose the opportunity to get any money for 2024. And I'm understanding that it's not that hard to file. You don't have to have a big plan. I thought you had to have a big plan, but I'll just read you what it said. And you know, maybe we need to look into this a little bit. I mean, this is not our bailiwick, but the water is all our concern. The applications called PEF forms, project evaluation forms, along with supporting documentation are due by August deadline. The information provided in the PEF allows the DMS, who I have no idea who they are, to rate and rank projects based on the severity of the public health or environmental problem that is being addressed and the appropriateness of the solution described. Um, so I, who, who submits that? Does it? That conservation would do that. Sewer commission. It's the sewer hmm? commission. It's the sewer commission. Sewer commission. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, the soul, and soul. I think with a vote from the board of selectmen. Yeah. Okay. So that's board. that's what's pending, and and you know I guess the part that was upsetting was that we would lose any chance to get funding in 2024 under SRF. I have to give a lot of credit to Sue Dangle. For doing yes. that and bringing it forward, um, she's from. Um, she lives in the neighborhood of uh, Mashpee Pond. She's the uh, primary person that uh, for um, Save Mashpee Wakeby Pond Alliance. Their annual meeting is June 25th. Um, anybody can join their organization and come to their annual meeting. Um, and um, yeah, and I and and. Not only is she concerned about the ponds, she also talked about the Quashnet River. Um, and um, not just the Mashby River, but also the Quashnet River. And um, I think we have to uh, not forget Wakoya Bay in all of sure. this. I know there's, there's a wonderful, there's wonderful pond communities, but Wakoya Bay is, I feel, starting to get lost in, um, I don't understand where it is in the sewer plan at this point. It was supposed to be the next phase, and it seems to have been cut out. And Wakoya Bay is an important estuary. It's where all the baby fish are born, and it's extremely important to the health of our marine environment. Mm -hmm. um, and Wakoya Bay has been suffering the longest in the most severe. Um, okay, so. well, I just think people should look at that video and hear what she had to say. It was very brief, but it was right to the point, and 
you know, we just have to work with our people and hope we can really get some momentum here. I mean, um, do you want to do you want to write a memo to the Board of Selectmen and the Sewer Commission, encouraging them to move forward? Well, for one thing, we go to the Sewer Commission meeting tomorrow. Um, I've got to check what time that is. It's two o'clock, which is ex well for people who work. You can't do it's that. Extremely. I haven't been to one Sewer Commission meeting in a year because it's it, they're held during the day. Um, yeah. But anyways, I, uh, I I will. Thank you for saying that. I think I'll just uh. take that under advisement. But I would like to see some. Uh, it's just a movement. Oh, definitely. Okay, let's go back to just finish up five minutes. Historic District Commission. Was there any meeting? Dunkin' Donuts, but we talked about that. Did we already update you on the Dunkin' Donuts? Yeah, we did. I think yeah. we did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that was the last one. And plan review. Uh, plan review met and reviewed a proposal um, that you may have heard about to expand the Mashpee Neck Marina to incorporate an adjacent residential property. Oh, yeah. Uh, plan review met. Um, I met with the neighbors, a number, uh, many of the neighbors. Um, I met with the applicant. Um, it was important for me to understand uh, the commercial needs of the site, what the proposal was seeking to accomplish, and also understand the neighborhoods existing conditions but also their concerns ultimately i feel like i was able to um obtain the perspectives of both and recommend and and, and ultimately the plan review committee recommended a series of conditions that um allowed would allow if the board of appeals were able to make the findings to uh, approve the request um allow some the, the modest, a modest increase in the parking area, allow it to be incorporated in the permit area, um, but address a number of the neighborhood concerns, which included um, access to this parking area from Mashpee Neck Road. We would require internal access from Frog Pond Close. Um, limitations on, on uh, boat racks, no vertical storage. Um, I requested some changes in the landscaping plan for uh, different tree species so that there would be more increased canopy and better screening over time, residential stockade fencing, um, relatively hefty series of conditions. Um, I felt confident the neighborhood left plan review comfortable. How many people did you have? Uh, about 20 or, so? or 30? It was the busiest plan review meeting I've, I've ever had. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, and I made the motion a little bit differently than I normally do, whereas I normally recommend approval with conditions. At this point, I, I recommended condition, I, rec, these are the, I, I made the motion whereas these are the conditions the Plan Review Committee expects if the Board of Appeals is able to establish the findings they require to approve a permit. Um, so that was it. Okay. Um, uh, if any of you are interested in seeing the existing current site plan or the conditions proposed, I'd be happy to email them to you. I'd like to see them. That's sure. great. Okay. CPC committee, I didn't make my report. You oh, you didn't it. take your report. Okay. <clears throat> yep. So the CPC met uh, last week. Um, we um, voted to recommend town meeting fund uh, a cemetery restoration um, activity from the historical commission. I think it was about $85,000. Is that right, Lynn? It's about $85,000. Um, the, uh, the CPC also voted to recommend town meeting um, fund the disc golf project on the Schumann Road. Cool. Um, we have on hold the third application for this round, um, the application for $500,000 for the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, and we're waiting for three things, a vote by the Affordable Housing Trust um, affirming that they're applying for these funds. Um, a list of a short list of addresses that the that the funds would be used on, and that's basically the town owned parcels that you're working on. And there's um, in the um, application there was a long list of activities that could be funded. We wanted to see those prioritized, right? Just take them; they're all eligible uses of the money, but put them in order. Um, so that we know what you're going to work on at least first, second, third. Um, and um, I am the CPC's liaison on the HPP. 
Oh, cool. So keep me posted on those. Keep me put me on the email lists. I think I am. I'm in. I'm already get the agendas for the affordable housing committee. But um, yeah, um, we have started to. Um, and we used to do this a long time ago. Each project has a liaison that then gets you know in between our meetings works with the applicant, gets updates, sees what's going on, and reports on them at each meeting. So that's cool. where we are. Very good. Yeah. Sounds like good plans you've got going. Yeah. Well, Arden uh, Russell, who was here before, is the chair, and she has, you know, decades experience managing grants for the county, and then after that, the town of Barnstable. So she's... She brought in some forms that she's used in the past for things and um, is starting to work with staff um, to uh, kind of tighten up the tracking of the money. Okay. Well, are you here? Motion, well, I, second. second. Public comment. Oh. Oh, on we on still now. have more public comment. Oh, public content. Co okay, I'm sorry. On any subject <laughs> it's on at all. Agenda. Okay, you're no. right. Okay. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> Some of us don't sit quietly when we're being ignored. <laughs> okay. This is Lynn Barbie, 73 Surf Drive. A couple very short things. Um, I just would ask that on the... I spent some time doing some research on trees and on the, uh, the special exemption for the homeowners for the tree thing. You have native species. And I've been told by the tree man at Mahoney's, you, there's trees that grow well here that are common, but they're not native. And so if you, it's very restrictive to say native because they're very, native trees are hard to come by. But there are a lot of trees like the APCC and, and local people say lots of trees that we have that aren't native that would still be good trees to, but to plant. But not invasive. Yeah, 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 not invasive, not invasive, yes. So I would just say that might be very restrictive in a way that, um, that would be like indigenous to the area or indigenous to the region or something like that. I, I don't know. I'm just saying I, I'm not an arborist. Um, but the reason I came tonight is <clears throat> there was an item called solar bylaw on your agenda. Now I understand you're postponing it, but I have a very personal feeling about these solar bylaws. I worked very hard. On a solar bylaw, I think we have a very good solar bylaw, and I have a very visceral reaction when people are talking about overlays for certain people who all they did was cut down trees. We do not need overlays for specific special cases. We have a good bylaw the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Time to adjourn. Get me home to my Time to adjourn. Well, oh, get me home to my kids. Let's go. Okay. Commander, motion adjourned. Second. All right. Aye. 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 Congratulations, Cameron. Good meeting. Good meeting.